Good evening, everybody, and a happy new year. We are into another meeting from SOGO Society of Genito Urinary Oncology, which looks at urinary oncology with a multidisciplinary perspective. And we have the theme in today's meeting as locally advanced prostate cancer. As you all have seen the topics, uh, we have a good uh, array of uh, topics which would, in some way or the other, contribute to locally advanced CA prostate. And we have wonderful speakers today. Uh, they have been contributing in uro oncology uh, to a great extent. All the speakers and our chairpersons, and we have two distinguished international speakers with us: Dr. Claudes and Dr. Amar Kishan. We all know Dr. Claudes, and he will have a formal introduction later. But he is professor from the University of Toronto into uro oncology. Uh, I call upon the session one uh, moderators, uh, chairpersons to join and carry on this meeting forward. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Anup Kumar, who is a professor and head at Safdarjang of uh, Urology, and uh, I welcome Dr. Gagan Gautam, who is a urologist uh, at Max Saket in a, a urology unit. He heads the unit. So, please, Anup and Gagan. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganesh, uh, uh, for inviting us for this uh, very uh, exciting uh, session. And I welcome my co-chairperson, Dr. Gagan Gautam and Dr. Heman Tongonkar. So uh, we start with the first presentation of the session: the testosterone levels in the treatment of CA prostate. What we should know about? And we have a very young and dynamic uh, urologist, Dr. Gagan Prakash. He's a professor uh, in Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. So, uh, uh, Dr. Gagan, uh, please you can start uh, sharing your screen. Thank you, Dr. Anup. <clears throat> I hope the slides are seen. Yeah, please carry on, please. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Testosterone level in treatment of prostate cancer. What we should know about it? It was only while reading about this topic when I realized that our knowledge on this subject is standing on the foundation of four Nobel prizes: synthesis of testosterone in 1939, concept of androgen deprivation 1966. Charles Higgins, that most of us are aware of. But then there is also the discovery of RIA. By which testosterone is measured, and the concept of LHRH, uh, both in 1977. We all know that androgens drive androgen receptor activity. We are used to ordering testosterone in our patients with prostate cancer to ensure the castration levels. Earlier, 50 nanograms per deciliter. That's 1.7 nanomole per liter. The unit uh, mentioned in most Western literature. Was considered good enough. The reason this value was chosen was because that's the lowest limit, or what's known as the linearity of the machines available then. With more accurate measurements, a lower value of 20 nanograms per deciliter or 0.4 nanomoles per liter came into practice in defining castration. Let me start with the mention of Canadian consensus statement, which was led by Dr. Claudes. It clearly mentions that there. Appears to be a clinical benefit of achieving a testosterone level of less than 20, and that should be the clinical goal. I'll be using the unit which is using, which is commonly used in India. So, 0.7 is less than 20. Further, it emphasizes that a regular monitoring of testosterone should be done along with PSA throughout the first year of treatment with androgen deprivation. Amongst the essays which are commonly used, there is RIA, chemilusins, and liquid chromatography mass spectroscopy. And this mass spectroscopy was considered the gold standard for testosterone assays. Although I've been told that in India there are hardly any centers which use uh, mass spectroscopy. Most use RIA and chemilusins. Dr. Claudes in this study published in JCU a couple of years back found that by keeping testosterone less than 20, we are able to delay the time to CRPC. And also improve cancer-specific survival compared to if it was between 20 to 50, or if it was more than 50. So these are the curves of time to castration or castration-resistant prostate cancer and the 
uh, cancer specific survival and it has compared the three values less than 20 20 to 50 and more than 50 and you can see how the curves have been converging the concept of testosterone breakthrough while we are all aware that the initial surge or flare phenomenon happens there is another concept called the breakthrough which again dr claude was involved in uh, describing and published very recently few months back in the journal of urology testosterone breakthrough is a rise in testosterone above a predetermined threshold occurring any time after the first month of treatment whereas treatment failure refers to a prolonged breakthrough defined as two or more testosterone measurements above threshold Breakthroughs are generally indicative of treatment deficiency and could be because of administrative or device failures, tapering off of the drug levels towards the end of an administration cycle, or could indicate resistance of the pituitary gonadal axis to ADT. They further compared the breakthrough rates in different, amongst different ADT agents, agonists versus antagonists, in different depot preparations and by different assays. They concluded that testosterone breakthroughs likely results in worse clinical outcomes and should be avoided. There is a need to standardize assessment of testosterone levels both clinically and in the research context. Testosterone levels have been used as a surrogate to compare various options of ADT. Now, before going to the next aspect about testosterone, let me ask you to read this statement and ask yourself if you consider this true or false. The statement is high testosterone promotes the development of prostate cancer, low testosterone is protective and the administration of testosterone to a man with existing prostate cancer is like feeding a hungry tumor or pouring gasoline on a fire. Now there's been a paradigm shift in our understanding of the interaction between testosterone and prostate cancer. Prostate tissue is exquisitely sensitive to changes in serum testosterone at low concentrations, but becomes indifferent to changes at higher testosterone concentration. And this is something called as the saturation model, which is in stark contrast to what we knew for the last three decades. Further, changes in PSA are noted when the serum testosterone is manipulated into or out of castration range, whereas minimal or absent PSA changes occur when supraphysiological testosterone doses are administered. Which means if you are adding testosterone to somebody, either exogenous or endogenous, it is not going to have a change in his PSA levels. Seen in various meta-analysis now, does exogenous or endogenous testosterone increase the risk of developing prostate cancer? Clearly, no. In fact, on the contrary, low testosterone increases the chances of somebody having a positive prostate biopsy. Also, lower baseline serum testosterone concentrations are associated with higher grade prostate cancer and higher stage at presentation. I would just like to remind you a bit of the physiology over here that there are essentially two hormones which are working, testosterone and DHT. And DHT primarily plays a role in the prostate, uh, the scalp genital differentiation and copra cavernosa, whereas testosterone appears to be the dominant androgen to spermatogenesis, muscle and bone, largely related to the adverse effects which we see in men with ADT. Uh, now, testosterone therapy in men with prostate cancer essentially is prostate cancer, ADT, hypogonadism, and quality of life. Now, what if we consider if we can improve the sexual interest and performance, improve mood and energy, increase the muscle and bony density, decreased fat and possibly improved longevity in our patients after they have completed treatment. So the concept of testosterone therapy in men with prostate cancer, and there have been various series who've tried and given testosterone after prostatectomy, after uh, brachytherapy or EBRT, and even on men in active surveillance. There's been some consensus about it from uh, this paper from Europe Urology, which says that uh, you know, there are, there are certain criteria based on which in some men you could consider starting them on testosterone therapy after their prostate cancer treatment has been is over. Some interesting concepts being invested currently. Using testosterone levels in nomograms to predict a positive biopsy or to predict recurrence after radical prostatectomy. Believe it or not, but an intermittent High dose testosterone therapy, also known as the BAT therapy, that is bipolar androgen therapy, 
using intermittent high dose testosterone therapy is being considered in a few randomized controlled trials and likely to show benefit in management of crpc let me end my talk by acknowledging these two reads which were eye openers for me also thanks to the stock for the first time in the last decade i actually visited the biochemistry department and the iri section and saw what is happening in our hospital we are using uh, the chemilicens technique at tata memorial hospital and i have been told that that's what most hospitals use it would be worthwhile knowing what is the lower linearity of using uh, of checking psa or testosterone in your hospital and yeah that's uh, dr bhushan our specialist registrar who helped me compile this and make these slides thank you for your attention thank you very much dr gagan uh, for finishing in time and for a very lucid talk uh, i just want to ask you one quick question yeah uh, do we have any literature to support if you start uh, adt in a patient of hormone sensitive prostate cancer and the castration level has not been achieved if we change from agonist to antagonist from one agonist to other agonist or uh, we change from medical castration to surgical castration yeah, is there yeah. any change in the response yeah so uh, we have literatures to suggest that this is what which should be done but literature to suggest that which is the best change is some somewhat lacking but i think in the indian context where surgical orchidectomies is still an option i think that's something which should be strongly considered if you look actually the uh, the same paper about the canadian consensus and uh, the some other uh, paper again by dr claus they have made a flow chart about what should be done in this scenario so depending on whether the patient is uh, castration sensitive or crpc what is the range whether it is falling in 20 to 40 or more than 50 uh, uh, a change to another form of adt should be considered Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So now hi, I will. Can I can I also ask you one question? Yeah. Hi. Uh, and uh, yeah. you you have a penchant for taking a relatively bland topic and making it interesting and delivering a very nice, uh, concise presentation on that. Uh, firstly, my compliments on that. Uh, the the question that I wanted to ask was that if you if you have a patient who is on EDT for for prostate cancer. and given yeah. this concept of micro surges and testosterone breakthrough which you have uh, talked very nicely in your talk uh, do you uh, do you, do you do we really need to monitor the testosterone levels regularly like we do the psa levels uh, or we as long as uh, the psa is suppressed we don't need to monitor testosterone levels in a patient who is castration sensitive and is on adt so actually the only you know consensus document which was the one which uh, from canadian consensus says that it should be uh, tested regularly in the first year and uh, they've gone ahead to saying that it should be monitored 3 to 6 monthly uh, now what i am not sure of that in uh, today when we are adding abiratron or docetaxel to our patients routinely whether this whole importance of micro surges and it translating into a clinical change really uh, holds good today or no i, I think uh, maybe dr claus because he he has been involved in all these papers which i have mentioned maybe he can add on something about this but the consensus said that you sure. should be testing testosterone regularly at least in the first year yeah thanks and thanks for referencing my data and good evening everyone so just a couple of quick comments uh, we do monitor testosterone pretty much every time there's a psa being done and the the data is pretty clear that just going on psa alone is not enough because the it's the the subtle increase in testosterone seems to drive progression and you can't detect this until it's too late uh and that's really the message of uh, not just our study but there's now about 8 of them in the literature they're they're 100% con- almost 100% consistent that the lower testosterone is better and it's also consistent with the overall understanding we have now that more aggressive targeting of the androgen receptor axis gives better results and uh Dr. Pragish the point you make about the the ARATs used in combination uh you know we have no idea about that uh there is one indirect observation from Marodi that the benefit of combined androgen blockade is mainly seen in patients whose testosterone is not adequately suppressed so my guess is if you're on a combination therapy it's probably less critical but we just have no data at all 
Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, now we'll request Dr. Gagan Gautam to invite the next speaker, please. Thank you for this honor. I get the honor to invite my good friend, Dr. Sanjay Adla, who obviously needs no introduction. Uh, he is a fantastic uro-oncologist and a robotic surgeon from Apollo Hyderabad. And I would request him to uh, speak on his topic, which is node positive prostate cancer and optimal evidence-based therapy to include pathological and clinical node positive. Sanjay, you're looking really handsome with your <laughs> new look. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I'll give you some competition for a change. <laughs> uh, hopefully you can all see it. I'll just go into the... Absolutely. We can see your screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Very interesting topic and I learned quite a lot and hopefully I can transmit that across to you. So management of uh, N plus prostate cancer, both clinical as well as pathological. Firstly, whenever we are trying to treat something, let's try to understand what do we mean when we say clinical node positive. So I'll give you a scenario, a common one, 60 year old who has got PSA of 12, Gleason scored four plus three, four out of six scores on the right side positive. So as the staging goes, we did an MRI and bone scan and it picks up a seven millimeter left-sided pelvic lymph node like the one here. And the restricted diffusion, because it is such a small size, they were not very sure of. Then as everybody does it, we did a PSMA pet and then the PSMA pet does pick up a bit, but the SUV max was four. So do we categorize him as a clinically lymph node positive patient. So what is good for lymph node detection or how can we diagnose more of clinically lymph node positive patients? Whether CT or MRI scan is better or a PSMA PET is better or a nomogram is better. So there are quite a few studies, but for the want of time, I have just chosen this one, the most recent 2021 January published uh, this month. PSMA versus MRI scan versus nomogram. So what they did is 233 patients who underwent a three Tesla MPMRI pre-biopsy compared that with a PSMA PET when they had been diagnosed with prostate cancer and all the patients went on to have a prostatectomy plus extended pelvic lymph node dissection. So this was considered as the gold standard. Whatever the picked up on the EPLND that was compared to the MPMRI and the, uh, sorry for this, MPMRI and the PSMA PET. So they also added in the CAPRA scores, MSKCC nomogram and the Briganti nomograms to see whether it would add anything more to this. So what did it show? It was surprising that the median diameter of a pathologically positive lymph node was four millimeters and that almost rules out we won't pick this up with the MRI scan. The second, for a pathological lymph node to be positive on the MRI scan, the minimum size it was, was 11.7 millimeters. Whereas for a PSMA, it was smaller at seven millimeters. So just by that size criteria, we can pick up smaller positive lymph nodes using a PSMA PET. The second is the more important, what is the positive predictive value or more importantly, the negative predictive value much better compared to the MPMRI for the PSMA PET, okay? But the take home message in this one is this, which is patients who had ISUP four to five on the biopsy, who had a pyrad five lesion on the prostate, they had greater than 30% chance of lymph node positive despite having a PSMA PET negative. So what that indicates is for the routine purposes, PSMA PET is good for lymph node staging, but in high risk patients, irrespective of whatever the scans are showing, please do an EPLND that will give you a better answer. So what is clinically node positive? All the guidelines point towards MPMRI and a CT scan and where we take the size as well as the character into consideration, which is diffusion weighted imaging, but PSMA PET is established now and in India we tend to be doing it more and more and we know it is more sensitive as well as specific. In high risk patients, irrespective of whatever the PSMA says, 
do do an extended pelvic lymph node dissection at the time of RP or a whole pelvic RT when the patient goes down the line of radiotherapy. So how do we manage now that we, have, we know what is a better way of picking up clinically node positive patients? These are the four options we have. We can keep an eye on them, ADT, ADT plus RT or RP plus EPLND. So can we keep an eye on? So a patient who has got non-metastatic but lymph node positive patients, can we keep an eye on them? Very well studied in this EORTC 30891. There are two papers from that, one looking at the PSA, one looking at the long-term outcomes. And what, it, what they did is they had immediate ADT versus deferred ADT. Quite well powered, almost 500 patients in each arm and they had M0. So all of them were non-metastatic. They might have lymph node positive or might not have lymph node positive, but all of them were non-metastatic according to whatever the, the screening imaging that was available at that time. So overall, it was noted that slightly immediate ADT was better, but there were some staggering numbers. So when you look at the progression, this is what they used to define progression in that when they would start the in the delayed arm, when they would start the ADT. But what you would know is in the patients who were not started on the initial ADT, around for the 50% of the patients to be started on ADT for progression, it almost took seven and a half years. So when you delay the ADT in this cohort of patients, the median initiation of ADT is almost seven and a half years. And the second element of it is quite a lot of patients died before they were ever started on ADT. So we can keep an eye on it and you look and look at all this, all cause mortality, they are in and around the them. Slightly better with immediate ADT, but just because somebody has got lymph node positive doesn't mean that they need treatment. Okay. So the conclusions, a take home number was, if a patient has got a PSA that is less than 50 and a PSA doubling time of more than 12 months, we can start them on watchful waiting. We don't need to immediately start them on ADT. Okay, so that is the conclusions from the EORTC trial. So we have done the watchful wait on the ADT. When do we consider ADT plus RT or RP plus EPLND? So this one was looking at those three treatment options. Okay, so this one was from the National Cancer Database, started off with almost uh, 100,000 patients, ended up with almost 3,000 patients who had either ADT alone or ADT plus local treatment. So quite good number of patients. They had thousand patients in this and similar, quite good enough matched cohorts with respect to local treatment as surgery or radiotherapy. And this is what is there. So when you have ADT versus local treatment plus ADT, when you look at the numbers, you're talking of five year survival of around 50% with ADT alone it rises up to 80% with ADT plus local treatment. So local treatment could be both surgery as well as radiotherapy. So giving local treatment in younger cohort of patients with clinically lymph node positive cohort do benefit from local treatment. So this is from a, a database. So there would be a huge amount of bias before I show you the second slide, which is it says that surgery is slightly better compared to radiotherapy. That needs to be taken with a bag of salt because there would be a huge selection bias. So what this take home message from this one is that local treatment in a patient who is fit enough to be considered for radical treatment or need a curative intent, we can give local treatment along with ADT if we are going down the line of RT. I've looked at the systemic review of uh, how do we treat this clinically node positive. And as you can see, they started off with 635 studies and ended up with five. And I just wanted to see, show you the five studies they have taken. And the one that I just showed you before is the CSEN study. And you look at the bias in selection of patients, serious, moderate bias with respect to intervention, only when you come to the follow-up it seems to be less. So all the studies that have been studied in the meta-analysis are observational studies. So we have to take the conclusion unless the hazard ratios were markedly different, we have to think, could there be a huge amount of bias in this? So these are the studies that 
have been uh, looked in the meta analysis and when you look at this so when you look at the survival again going back to the same numbers that i said so when you give local treatment the five year survival is in the range of 80% when you do not give local treatment the survival is around 50% and that is across all the studies that have been studied and then the second is more importantly the hazard ratio if you look at the hazard ratio we are talking of 0.3 0.6 0.66 0.5 indicating that local treatment definitely has a role in patients who have got clinically lymph node positive disease take home messages in a patient who has got a poor performance status watchful wait especially in this cohort or adt whereas in patients who have got good performance status good life expectancy adt plus rt or rp plus eplnd as a part of multimodality treatment can be considered there are no rcts in this setting what about a patient wherein we do the surgery and they end up having pathological lymph node positive disease the reason why this is important is i'm just quoting ginell's recent paper that is published mainly for looking at this number which is when you look at all cohort of patients around 20% of them will have lymph node positive disease so rp patients in india around 20% of them will have lymph node positive so we need to know how to treat these patients and this one was quite again well studied uh, from the national cancer database which is sorry this is the uh, randomized control trial that we have grown up with which we call as the messing trial and the main problem with this one is the 98 was the overall study cohort that's one and then the second is the patients who were on adt on clinical progression was very very poorly treated so that's the reason when we were starting all the patients with lymph node positive on immediate adt this was the study that we were using and what it showed is that immediate adt does seem to make a difference but the numbers were too small and this was the peri psa era so psa was not used in majority part of this study so the options that we are left with when we have a pathologically lymph node positive patient is to keep an eye on them adt or adt plus rt okay so this one again quite a well studied one from three centers there is another one which is a bigger one but this one is a much better one so three centers almost 1400 patients around a third had observation 50% had adt and 23% had ebrt plus adt but still quite good numbers so these were all pathologically lymph node positive patients who were treated along these three lines and i want to show you again the hazard ratios hazard ratios when you give them adt compared to observation when you give them adt so this is observation not doing anything else when you give them adt hazard ratio is 0.65 when you give them ebrt 0.27 giving them radiotherapy makes a huge difference there would be a selection bias because these are observational studies and when you look at cancer specific survival you look at this one 0.15 this is staggeringly good so for patients who have got pathological lymph node positive do consider them or definitely consider them for adt plus ebrt does that mean all the patients who have got pathological lymph nodes do they need treatment this is the study from the uh, american cancer database so this one had 1400 patients sorry 14000 patients who started off with rp and plnd and the study cohort was 5500 patients who had adt who had pathological lymph node and who were treated with adt or adt plus rt and then they divided them into this five groups and i want okay, you to uh, notice can this you please uh, wind up please last two slides yeah please okay so this one is quite an important one so they divided them into five groups so one is pathologically one or two lymph nodes low gleason one or two lymph nodes high gleasons for negative margins one or two lymph nodes high gleasons and positive margins three to four lymph nodes and more than four lymph nodes and what they found is comparing adt to adt plus rt this one i would ignore just because the number of patients was small whereas when you look at low gleason low low number of lymph nodes and high gleasons margin negative there doesn't seem to be a difference especially when you have got that many number of patients it seems to 
RT seems to work only in patients who have got high Gleason, low lymph node volume, and positive margins, or patients who have got three to four lymph nodes. And again, it doesn't tend to work in patients who have got more than four lymph nodes. Probably these people have metastatic disease. That's what I wanted you to note. Okay. So again, these four groups. If you just wanted, where is the RT indicated? RT is indicated in patients who have got high Gleason, positive margin, or a larger volume of lymph nodes, but not more than four. It doesn't work in this. It doesn't work in these two. And when you look at the hazard ratio, hazard ratio with group one and two is more than one. It seems to only work in this middle two, which is one or two lymph nodes with margin positive. Take home message. PSM mapet seems to be the standard. However, always consider EPLND in high-risk prostate cancer patients. Clinical T1 depends on the performance status, either watchful wait or ADT. For good for performance status, ADT plus RT or RPL or RP plus EPLND. And the patients who have got pathological lymph nodes, the radiotherapy along with ADT works in this middle cohort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay. Very, very uh, excellent presentation. Uh, you have covered almost every topic. Uh, since you're running late, I think we can ask you one quick question and Dr. Gagan can ask you one other question. Uh, do you tell, can you tell us uh, along with the number of lymph nodes, the station of lymph node also matters. Suppose we have a common aric lymph node involved. We have a uh, preterm lymph node involved and we have a periotic lymph node involved. So how does these three stations will change your management? I think this is something uh, we want to listen from you. Please unmute yourself. The lymph node studies, majority of them that have got proper numbers are uh, database based studies. So that's the reason we don't have the ones that have had a proper template lymph node dissection done, they did not have a survival study associated with it. So I think where the number is more than four lymph nodes, I think they have a systemic disease in that systemic metastasis. So I think they might benefit more with abiraterone or enzalutamide. So you treat them like a metastatic, though they are only N1. So hopefully I've answered. And going down the same line, if they have got a non-pelvic lymph nodes, Actually, they need to be characterized as low volume metastatic disease anyway. In Stampede, that's what they do. So we need to go down the line of systemic treatment for them. Great talk, Sanjay. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, you want to, uh, you want to uh, give a comment, uh, Anu? You, oh. were you were saying something? No, no, no. Please All go. Right. All right. Yeah. So, so great talk, Sanjay, as usual, very precise. Uh, just one quick comment and one quick question for you. The comment is that uh, we, in, in our own database of radical prostatectomies, and we have sent that paper uh, for consideration for publication, we have found that about 20 to 30 percent of lymph node positive patients who have less than two lymph nodes involved, one or two lymph nodes involved, uh, and have been kept on observation over a period of time, they do not develop biochemical recurrence for a long period of time, provided a good uh, EPLND has been performed along with RARP. So there may be a role of not giving any treatment at all for low volume pathological node positive disease provided an APLND has been done along with radical prostatectomy. And the question that I have for you is uh, that, you know, this controversy between clinical, uh, between radiation therapy plus ADT versus surgery and EPLND, RP plus EPLND in patients who are clinically one or two lymph node positive. If a person walk, and of course we know that in the guidelines, RT plus ADT seem to be the preferred option. Uh, but as you have rightly mentioned in multimodality therapy, we can actually sequence it or we can do surgery first as well. So if a patient comes into your clinic, how do you counsel him about these two different options and, and what in your experience do these people choose? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Gagan. So the, answering the first question regarding uh, two or less than two lymph nodes, I think there now that we know that the lymph node density involvement seems to be a factor, I think one or two lymph nodes, and there are quite long-term studies showing that they are potentially cured, similar to the bladder cancer patients probably. So all patients don't need to be treated. I agree with that. And I would always be guided by the uh, 
uh, you never have a PSA that is unrecordable when somebody has three to four lymph nodes. Only when there are one or two lymph nodes, you will have a PSA that is unrecordable. So I would be guided by the PSA in that cohort. That's one. Then the second one, where do we go further? Whether uh, RT, ADT plus RT is the standard of care. It is a standard of care by convention rather than by comparison. That's one. It has been studied much more with ADT plus RT compared to surgery. Surgery hasn't been studied in any sort of uh, RCT setup in that cohort of patients. So that's the reason it is there is more evidence backing it, uh, RT just because there are more studies in that sector. So it is for us as surgeons, along with the guidance from Professor Vedang Murthy, for us to generate evidence backing surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Would you like to, uh, Anup? Uh, sir, I think uh, we are very yeah. short of time, sir. Yeah, yeah, please, please invite Anand. Yeah. yeah, 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 please. So uh, we go to the next and the last presentation of this session. And I invite my dear friend, uh, we share our common guru, Dr. Vipul Patel, Dr. Anand Krishnan. He's a director, I think one of the leading robotic urologist from uh, Chennai. He will be talking about pentafecta, trifecta, and RP for high risk CA prostate locally advanced. Are we able to achieve it? Dr. Anand Krishnan, please you can share your screen. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairperson, Sir, Dr. Anup, and Dr. Gagan. <coughs> and I must thank uh, Dr. Ganesh and Dr. Raghu for uh, this opportunity. Uh, are we able to see my screen? Yeah, no, absolutely. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so today's topic is about pentafecta trifecta in uh, radical prostatectomy for high risk and locally advanced prostate cancer. Are we able to achieve it? And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about trifecta and pentafecta and then rationale and the current status of uh, uh, both and are we able to achieve it for whom and how do we do it? So what is trifecta? Um, you know, it, it, it came from horse racing parlance and perfecta means predicting which horse comes one, two, and three, uh, which horses come one, two, and three. And trifecta in prostate cancer means cancer control, continence, and potency. Now, the original paper was uh, from Claude Abdul's group, which where they projected a combined way of presenting all these three uh, parameters, biochemical recurrence, continence, and potency. But one of the key points in that paper was the gave differential weightage to each of these parameters. As a result, biochemical recurrence had four points, continence two and potency one. So I think this was a key element that a lot of the subsequent papers missed out. And uh, the next paper that came out of significant paper was from the MSKCC group, uh, uh, East Simmons Cardinal, Catan, and they popularized this term trifecta. Uh, but one of the remarks in that paper was one outcome, that is one parameter, maybe at the expense of the other in trifecta. So a lot of the subsequent papers that came out tried to dispel this myth or fact. You know, we came out with the, uh, the, the trifecta results and uh, from the GRI, Dr. Patel's group, was, it, we had achieved it in 91% while the MSKCC group had 70% uh, trifecta results. Um, and there was significant lacuna in the trifecta outcomes. You know, they don't present the entire picture. Uh, imagine a patient who's had prostatectomy and he's had a rectal injury and colostomy, but he can potentially still reach the trifecta. And postal surgical margins are not only a very good surrogate of biochemical recurrence, but they also have a significant impact on the quality of life of the patient because of the fear of recurrence. So we needed a more comprehensive outcome method and that's why um, we came out with the pentafecta. The pentafecta was trifecta outcomes with negative surgical margins and no complications. And when we came out with the pentafecta uh, outcomes, uh, there was, uh, you know, at that point, pertinent to this talk, 95% of the patients that were included in that particular paper were low risk patients. Now, a lot of the high risk patients didn't even come into the picture, right? So at that point in time, when we came out with the pentafecta outcomes, the patient age and pathological stage were the uh, only factors associated with pentafecta outcomes. So actually we started out with eight 
parameters, the octa factor, we called it. But then every, every time we send it out to uh, publications, one of the reviewers said, I, I, uh, drop down one of the parameters and then it came down to penta factor from octa factor. So the other three parameters that we did include were length of stay, pain, and uh, length of catheterization. So what is the purpose of these scores? You know, if you look at it, trifecta, pentafecta, what do they essentially achieve? It's a way of counseling the patients, right? A very good way of counseling the patients and assessment of surgical quality as well. And also to temper patients' expectations. A lot of papers that were, a lot of studies that came out at that point in time suggested that patients do tend to have regret because they underwent a body prostatectomy because of the expectations, right? So these studies potentially help us tailor the patient's expectations, these scores actually. So what, are the, what is the current status, trifecta, pentafecta, and what has changed in the last 10 years? The number of high-risk cases, the number of high-risk cases that we operated or are operating has significantly increased. Number of locally advanced prostate cancer. If you look at the previous talk, uh, uh, Sanjay was talking about node positive cases getting operated. Right? Or actually a number of uh, high risk and LAPC that have come for surgical treatment. That's actually been the change. And uh, the dogma is slowly changing. You know, previously 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when somebody, uh, if somebody told you we're operating oligometastatic disease, we, it, it wouldn't have been a uh, you know, probable situation. But now we're talking about it. And more and more people want to come into this particular group. We're substratifying patients in the oligometastatic group who may benefit from potential local treatment. And certainly large European groups or large centers have seen this change, changing from low risk pattern, low risk spectrum to a higher risk spectrum, changing from a favorable disease pattern, which lends itself very well to surgery, to a higher risk pattern where surgery becomes a little bit more complex. So if you look at the recent studies that uh, looked at what pentafact outcomes have been, and they all have a certain pattern, you know, preoperative PSA, risk groups, and T stages made a significant difference. But, uh, and if you looked at low risk group, what drives the pentafact outcomes, or in other words, what prevents the pentafact outcomes from being reached is potency. But when you look at high risk groups, biochemical recurrence is the one that prevents people from achieving the pentafactor. But so let's come up to the first indisputable point. Higher risk group entails a higher biochemical recurrence or higher margin positivity. So this is something that we cannot uh, dispute at all. Uh, but what can we take away from this? You know, uh, other than prostate size, preoperative PSA, T3, and Gleason more than seven, these are things that certainly impact the pentafactor rates but also surgical volume. If a surgeon uh, was operating more than 200 cases a year or more than uh, 100 to 200 cases versus less than 100 cases, it did make a difference in them being able to achieve pentafact outcomes. And certainly when you look at margin positivity of a higher volume center versus a lower volume center, you do see this particular difference going on. So there's the same Italian paper that I uh, showed you initially. So, uh, they looked at their pentafactor rates in 2009 versus 2018. So there's a definite trend in improving their pentafactor outcomes as their um, surgical experience improved. And also along with that, a definite trend in more higher risk cases being operated as well. So the next is these two entities, positive surgical margins and potency, that is positive margins and nerve preservation seem like competing parameters. But actually, when you, when you go down a little bit more deeper into it, they can actually potentially be achieved together, right? Both margin negativity and nerve preservation. So one of our chairpersons, Dr. Anup, I think wrote this uh, paper. Most of the margin extra capsular extensions were within uh, three millimeters in 85% of patients and, 90, uh, and five millimeters in 97% of the patients. So when you look at nerve preservation, you can potentially do an incremental nerve preservation in these patients and potentially give them a negative margin as well. So other than the routine culprits like high tumor burden, positive course on preoperative biopsy, pathological stage, tumor volume, 
if you tailor your surgery for that particular patient, you may be potentially able to achieve a good nerve preservation as well as negative margins. So this study by uh, Dr. Anup, they were able to perform a nerve preservation either complete or partial on about 89.4% of the patients in spite of them being a high risk group. So this is where the prosthetic, uh, the, the, the anatomical cues come into picture. The role of prostate vasculature as a landmark. Previously, we used this prostate artery as a landmark to guide us to go and do a full nerve preservation. But when you're doing high risk uh, prostate cancer, these, this landmark helps you go lateral to the prostate artery and as a result, leave a little bit more neurovascular bundle on the prostate than uh, when, you would, when you're doing a full nerve preservation. So as a result, it's all about grading the nerve preservation, tailoring the surgery to the patient's cancer load. Uh, you can either do a, nerve pres a full nerve preservation, incremental or a non-nerve preservation on one side and other based on the cancer load of the patient. So I'm not going to go into details on surgical modifications, uh, but you know, a lot of uh, people ask, how do you know whether it's three millimeters or five millimeters? And an easy way of doing this is uh, when you put your bi uh, uh, bipolar or either a plasma kinetic onto the prostate, close to the prostate, you at least leave a little bit of three millimeters of tissue on the prostate and you can cut lateral to it. So if you see this particular area, I've left about a good chunk of neurovascular bundle. And these, this is how I, you can generally identify which is three millimeters and five millimeters and so on. So what about continence rates and techniques? Uh, we, is there any change for high risk patients? Of course, there's a change. We have all had innumerable number of ways in which we can modify for continence, bladder neck reconstruction, periuteral suspension stage, posterior, anterior, minimal apical dissection. But to be honest, the final word on this has not been said. But the only thing that's made a difference in this recent years is the Rexius pairing, where definite improvement in continence has been projected. But we have to wait and see whether biochemical recurrence and positive surgical margins are uh, either higher or lower in this particular technique. The final word on this hasn't been said as yet as well. Uh, regarding apical dissection, this is, uh, I'm going to quickly skip on to a different part of this video. Uh, again, I believe that the amount of intraurethral, intra-abdominal urethra makes a difference in the continence as well. And when we're doing apical dis dissection, you can either cut the urethra closer to the prostate about, um, or closer to the sphincter as well, depending upon the cancer load of the patient, where it is on the MRI and so on and so forth. Again, um, you know, just quickly giving you an idea. So if it's a high risk case, I won't dig deeper into the uh, prostate and uh, free up as much of the urethra, go a little bit higher and cut the urethra at a different level when we compare it to a low risk case. So this is what I was trying to imply. Depending upon the cancer load and where in the prostate the cancer is, we would either go closer to the prostate, mid-level, or away from the prostate as well. The next point is, does higher risk, higher stage represent more complications? Again, this is part of the Pentefact outcome, but the good news is no. It doesn't have improved, increased complications when you're operating on a higher risk patient in terms of uh, their cancer load. But what are the steps you can to reduce complications? I think the key here is uh, you have to have a team. It is a protocol-based approach. Each stage is a stage-based individualization of steps. And there should be a pre-operative plan when you walk into the theater. Each person should know what exactly their role is. And these are steps to reduce complications. In low risk as well as high risk, it doesn't change much. What about in locally advanced prostate cancer? I think can you please wind up? This particular group is uh, we wouldn't do a nerve preservation. We would go ahead and do uh, um, complete non nerve sparing, but it has been done. A lot of centers are currently suggesting nerve preservation. So this is possible, but again, we have to select our patients very carefully when we're doing this. So, how do we select patients when we're doing in high risk and locally advanced? Age, again, that relates to potency. PSA level, is there a cutoff? Currently, there is no specific cutoff when we're talking about oligometastatic disease being operated. PSA level, but I would have a PSA cutoff of 40. Uh, site of the lesion, again, uh, I would go wider on that particular area, but if it's an apical lesion, very close and big tumor at the level of the apex, we invariably end up with positive margins. Gleason score, no cutoff. 
stage, again, there is no cutoff T3B, we're operating end stage, right? I wouldn't attempt to achieve a pent effect outcomes on these. They would all have a non-nurse bearing uh, surgery. And margin free versus nerve preservation, again, based on the tumor load. So the last slide, can we achieve pent effect? Uh, I think we have to give relative importance to the parameters. The number one parameter, I don't think we can change this at all, is oncological safety, biochemical reference, and positive surgical margins. And then you go on to complications. And finally come the functional outcomes where you give more importance to continence and potency. I think Pentafecta just without being given higher weightage to certain parameters um, is not good enough. So when you're counseling a patient, always counsel based on the importance of parameters and your ability to uh, reach the Pentafecta based on your data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anant. Very good presentation. Uh, we are running late. I think uh, we can just ask one question. Uh, Dr. Anant, you tell me, uh, because locally advanced prostate cancer is always a multimodality treatment. So whether we are going for surgery first, followed by ADT plus RT, or we are going only for ADT plus RT, do you think this penta factor should be made a standard criteria to actually compare these two modalities? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, to be honest, if, if the patient goes into multimodal treatment, they're going to treat the prostate bed plus the nodes. I think the erection goes out of the window straight away as after they've had surgery. So again, we're talking about a subset of patients who may not need to go into multimodal treatment for whom you're trying to achieve the quality of life along with their uh, cancer outcomes. So substratifying patients, potentially, they can benefit from this sort of treatment. Okay. Dr. Gagan, please, you can ask. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, f f there, I'm sure there will be a dozen questions, but I think Anup, you and I are never going to be made chairpersons again by <laughs> It was a fantastic session because I think all the three speakers delivered their messages in a very concise and precise manner. Uh, I for sure learned a lot. I'm sure the audience did too. Um, Anup, you want to hand over to Ganesh? Yeah. Well, so, sorry, you. sorry, Dr. Ganesh, for uh, over, no, over shooting your time. The session was in, uh, obviously <laughs> interesting, and these are difficult topics. Uh, when I spoke to Anant about it, uh, I had the this thing in mind, and I did tell him about the time, even for same thing with the San, uh, Sanjay's talk. So uh, I think uh, if we have discussed the take-home messages within the talks, let let's progress to the next uh, session. Where I call upon uh, Dr. Gagan Saini, uh, Dr. Rahul Krishnatri, and Dr. Himang Bakshi as the chairpersons. And I would also, I think, invite Dr. Srinivas to go on with his presentation, uh, the first talk, was sharing the screen. Sorry, the chairpersons, but I think uh, slight time will save in that. And you carry on the session from here forward. Thank you. So good evening. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. So good evening. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh uh, uh, um, and uh, Dr. Gagan uh, for inviting me. Um, my job for today is in the context of the three new contemporary randomized control trials of adjuvant versus salvage radiation therapy. The question which I've been asked to answer is, can we discard immediate adjuvant radiation? Before we dig into the question, let us understand what is immediate adjuvant for the sake of uh, <clears throat> the general audience. That when we talk about adjuvant radiation, we talk, are talking about post-operative radiation when the post-op PSA is in the undetectable range. Um, and, and typically that this kind of radiation is delivered between three to six months following surgery. And when we speak about early salvage radiation, it uh, typically means that we are dealing with the post-operative radiation after we notice a PSA increase, which is beyond more than uh, beyond uh, 0.1, but less than 0.2 or 0.5 nanogram per ml, where we want to salvage it early before we call it exactly a clear biochemical progression. <clears throat> 
Before we answer this question, uh, I mean, we all know about uh, there are several nomograms available. There are several, uh, even including genomic classifiers available to predict the risk of recurrence after radical prostatectomy. Uh, <clears throat> it was interesting to hear all the previous talks as well, which kind of elucidated some of these uh, risk factors and simple, some of the, you know, one of the most simple ones is the CAPRA score which has been used even in uh, the several randomized controlled trials to stratify, substratify patients. And <clears throat> you see that typically, for example, a CAPRA score of eight means that um, the patient would have a probability, 12% progression free probability at five years, which also means that, that there is an 88% chance that the patient would progress biochemically within a span of five years. <clears throat> To answer this question, we had three older generation randomized controlled trials. Uh, the largest one being the EORTC trial. We all know there are multiple uh, issues with these uh, clinical trials. The, the major ones being that the median PSA was, uh, was for example, in EORTC trial, the median PSA was 1.7 nanogram per ml which essentially means that uh, the patients were treated in the salvage setting, not in the adjuvant setting. So it clearly does not answer our question whether we can, uh, we can delay the treatment or we need to give immediate post-operative radiation. However, there is another trial, uh, AR09602, where you can see the inclusion criteria included post-operative PSA less than 0.5 nanogram per ml showed that at median follow-up of 10 years, uh, approximately the progression free survival was better in adjuvant RT. Numbers needed to treat was about five to avoid one biochemical progression. But these older generation trials had multiple issues. Uh, the PSA kinetics were not really looked into. But there are other newer retrospective studies, slightly better studied, uh, slightly, uh, of course, retrospective studies have their own uh, biases. But at least there are some kind of hypothesis generating large ones which could be looked into. For example, the one with uh, Abdullah et al, which uh, got published in 2013, which said patient with multiple risk factors, more than one uh, among these three, the Gleason grade four or above T3B disease, which is seminal vesicle involvement and node positive disease. A patient who has only one risk factor could not probably benefit significantly with adjuvant, but if a patient has more than one risk factor, that means two or more, the patient probably benefited with adjuvant radiation therapy according to this study. Also, as shown by uh, Sanjay as well in his, uh, uh, in, in his uh, presentation, patients with node positive disease with either uh, 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 more than two nodes or even less than two nodes with higher Gleason grade were uh, showing some uh, benefit with adjuvant radiation therapy. I, also want to highlight this particular study, which got published in JAMA uh, two years back, um, which was very interesting with the, uh, in the form of conclusion. I mean, I, it was interesting conclusion to draw that adjuvant radiation stops being beneficial compared to salvage approach if more than 52% of patients are controlled with RP alone, radical prospectomy alone. That means if, if you choose a cohort of patients where more than 50% of patients, more than half of them would be controlled with radical prostatectomy alone, this group would not be a group who would benefit with adjuvant radiation therapy. So coming back to the, uh, the question again, in, in context of the three major contemporary randomized control trials, we all know about them, uh, radicals, the French and the Australian study. Um, although <clears throat> they tried to answer the same question, uh, they had subtle differences in terms of trial design. Some, the, the, the French and the radicals were of superiority design and the Australian was the non-inferior design. But I would like you to focus on the key eligibility criteria of these three randomized control trials. The French study had the typical risk factors. It has to be either a T3 or above disease, positive surgical margins, uh, one of them have to be present to be called as a, a high risk patient to be eligible for this trial. The Australian study also had a very similar uh, uh, inclusion criteria. But if you see the radicals, which was actually the biggest randomized control trial, patients who had really early disease, such as PSA 6, say I'm just giving an example, PSA 6, 
a T2 disease with a positive surgical margins could be eligible. Patient with PSA 6, a T2 disease with Gleason 3 plus 4, just Gleason grade 2 would be an eligible patient in this trial. Patient with Gleason 6, T2 disease with preoperative PSA more than 10, even 11 nanogram per ml, no risk factors, no positive surgical margins. Gleason 6, T2 disease, just because PSA is more than 10, the patient could be eligible for radical RT. And no wonder in these kind of uh, cohort of slightly early and low risk patients, we, we, uh, they, they did not see any benefit of, uh, of adjuvant radiation therapy. But as I said, it was a superiority design, the radicals in the French, and they did not show, uh, they, they showed that adjuvant radiotherapy indeed was not superior to early salvage radiation therapy. So on the basis of these results, do we discard immediate adjuvant radiation therapy after radical prostatectomy? The, my answer would be no, and the reasons are, are, are following. There is a significant under-representation of the high-risk cohort. The Gleason grade 4 and 5 are less than 1 in 6. The T3B disease were less than 1 in 5, and you see that the baseline PSA was less than 10. The median baseline PSA was even less than 10. So you are looking at a really early uh, or a slightly lower risk cohort of patients. And no wonder, only 32% of patients who are randomized to salvage RT eventually received or required a salvage treatment. That means two thirds of them were controlled only with radical radiation therapy and uh, radical prostatectomy. I already showed you that if you have, a, 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 based on the retrospective study, it was a hypothesis generating, but you see that more than 50% who were controlled with radical prostatectomy, unlikely to benefit with adjuvant radiation therapy. How many were really node positive? Very few, looking at the baseline PSA. How many had multiple risk factors? That means either a T3B disease and glycinate, less than 5%. So these are some of the reasons why you could say that the high risk cohort was significantly underrepresented. The second main issue with these three trials were, although the primary endpoint was either a metastasis free survival or an overall survival, metastasis free survival primarily, the, the, the endpoints which were reported were biochemical progression free survival and hormones were allowed in patients who received both salvage radiation as well as adjuvant complicating the matters uh, uh, to assess this endpoint as, as a robust enough endpoint. <clears throat> of course, there are toxicity concerns. One would say, why would you want to give adjuvant when you have more toxicity? But you would see that the, although there was an increase in uh, toxicity with adjuvant radiation, the overall burden of absolute toxicity, the incidence of absolute toxicities were actually very, very minimal, less than two, less than 3% hematuria, less than 4% stricture. So, and this, this is despite the fact that modern techniques such as IMRT and image guided radiation therapy were not made mandatory in these uh, randomized control trials. Both GU as well as GI soft toxicity profile was quite exemplary. There is also a subtle point that I would like to mention that whenever we consider salvage radiation therapy, we are looking based on this NRG trial, uh, which is not yet published, but it is going to be published soon. We have the results already presented at major meetings that there is a need probably to consider pelvic radiation as well as ADT in salvage setting, depending on some of the preoperative factors. But the fact that we need to give a larger volume of radiation uh, if we are offering salvage radiation, which may not be really required every time we offer adjuvant radiation therapy. And why this question, I think uh, uh, this is extremely relevant today. This is uh, uh, one of the uh, studies which got uh, published recently. It actually clearly showed that the United States, at least the proportion risk of high risk prostate cancer has increased nearly double, as well as, as, as the previous speakers have elucidated, the proportion of men undergoing prostatectomy for high risk prostate cancer also nearly double as the incident, as the uh, the practice of radiation actually came down for high risk prostate cancers. This is even relevant in India. I could not really get the incidence of high risk uh, prostate cancers, but you see that in, this is an old data, 99 to 2002 from TMH, you see that the 71% uh, of patients had uh, metastasis at, uh, um, when they were uh, registered at TMH. Of course, this is just one hospital. Uh, the, I also got hold of TMH annual 
report 2019 and you see that nearly three fourths of patients of localized prostate cancer, 70 to 75 are of high risk subgroup. And, uh, and, 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 and still uh, TMHC, this is the old data, this is the new data, even still 40% of patients treated at uh, uh, the hospital were of palliative intent. That means you see in a large high volume center, not in a smaller private center, but a large high volume center, this is a relevant question of, uh, that a high risk cohort is extremely common. So to conclude, there is the lack of benefit of immediate adjuvant RT in prostate cancer as shown by these randomized trials cannot be generalized to all cohorts of patients uh, when especially when uh, there is an underrepresentation of the high risk cohort. There is weaker evidence from retrospective studies, of course, that needs to be tested prospectively in, in patients with adverse pathology could benefit with immediate adjuvant RT. The absolute toxicities, despite using adjuvant RT, remain low, uh, despite modern techniques not being mandatory. The contemporary trials are not yet mature enough to report more robust and more uh, mature endpoints such as metastasis free survival or overall survival yet. So that is also a reason just to hold on uh, to before we change our practice. And the question is extremely relevant in our setting since high risk prostate cancers are far more common than what uh, is uh, noticed in, in Europeans and Australians where these uh, trials were based. So we must continue to weigh our options after radical prostatectomy and adjuvant RT uh, according to me, cannot be discarded. Thank you. That was a great talk as usual, Dr. Srinivas, uh, with a uh, very nicely dissected uh, data. Uh, I'm sure it will benefit us all. Uh, just one question, uh, uh, you know, before we go to the next talk. So which would be uh, that group of patients after RB that you will see uh, uh, that you would certainly advise or go for adjuvant RT? where you would read? I would certainly discuss adjuvant RT in patients who have uh, node positive disease, those who have multiple risk factors. I would certainly discuss the option of adjuvant radiation therapy, especially those with multiple high risk factors. Uh, multiple means, uh, uh, except for node, which, 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 higher Gleason grade, uh, higher uh, uh, preoperative PSAs, uh, positive surgical margins, and seminal vesicle involvement, and lymph node positivity. These are some of the known uh, classical risk factors. And if we see that there are more risk factors in a given patient, you would discuss this adjuvant RT in, in, in those certain patients, in those group of patients. So most of the patients, so, so, so the typical classic indications of adjuvant. Those patients who have been operated uh, for high risk patient with uh, a node positive disease, with T3B disease, with a Gleason 8, these are the group of patients which I would, I would discuss, definitely. Thank you. So next, Dr. Vedang, uh, I think you can uh, present the post hormone therapy for the post-op patients. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rahul. Uh, Ganesh, I have taken the liberty of slightly changing the my uh, the title of my topic. Instead of duration, I made it optimizing because uh, there is more, much more to the story than just the duration. And I would have finished my talk in two minutes. So, so it's all about optimizing uh, ADT with salvage RT. Now, uh, uh, Srinivas has talked about adjuvant RT and why it is still alive. I am talking about uh, how to optimize when we are talking of salvage radiotherapy for biochemical failure. There are a number of ways in which we can improve the efficacy of salvage radiotherapy. Uh, and these are just some of them. Uh, it is believed that we need to give a higher dose to these patients that even up to 66 to 70 gray that improves outcomes to some extent. Uh, the technique is important, image guided and IMRT uh, improves, um, uh, reduces toxicity significantly. That has been shown in randomized trials. Uh, Srinima showed the SPORT trial, the RTOG0534, uh, adding uh, pelvic radiotherapy to uh, salvage rate, uh, RT may help in outcomes. And uh, we all know the famous, uh, uh, the curves that show that early salvage is better than late salvage. But this is not what I'm here to talk about. I am talking about another mechanism by which the efficacy of salvage radiotherapy can be improved. And that is adding ADT. Now, the questions we'll try to answer is, does it really help? If it does, in whom does it help? 
which agents may be preferred and how long, finally the duration question, how long is probably optimal. The first question is uh, very nicely answered by uh, two large randomized trials that have been reported recently. The French trial, which updated its data recently with uh, 112 months uh, follow-up, they uh, randomized patients who had early, uh, early uh, salvage. So the PSA was quite low to radiotherapy alone or radiotherapy plus six months of LHRH analog, Goserlin in this case, nearly 750 patients. And they showed uh, that six months of ADT improved, uh, adding to RT, improved the 10-year metastasis-free survival and progression-free survival, which was the primary endpoint, quite a significantly, nearly 15% improvement in PFS. Uh, you can see here, and all risk groups uh, defined by Gleason, margins, uh, seminal vesicle status benefited with adding ADT. So this is the one trial that shows significant improvement in outcomes. The American effort led by Dr. Shipley um, was uh, slightly different. Uh, these were more higher risk patients, as I'll show you in the next slide. They were randomized to receive uh, at biochemical failure to receive RT or with a placebo or with an antiandrogen. In this case, bicalutamide was given for two years at 150 milligrams. Similar size, 760 patients, and the primary endpoint was overall survival. Um, the graphs here show, again, I have marked it in, in red. 12-year overall survival improved by adding two years of ADT. So was the prostate cancer-specific survival and metastasis-free survival. What was important to note, and I'll show this to you later, nearly 70% of the patients had gynecomastia uh, associated with the bicalutamide. So again, a significantly positive trial. There, it is important to understand subtle differences between these two trials. Uh, this uh, cartoon shows that uh, on the right is the RTOG trial, on the left is a French trial. You can see the more orange it is, the higher risk features, including a higher PSA at baseline, um, margin positivity, higher T stage, and higher Gleason. So, so the RTOG trial was clearly the worst lot. These were not classically early salvage, they were late salvage and they received two years of ADT. That's the point to note between these two trials and that showed overall survival benefit. Now, there's a very recent post hoc analysis of this RTOG trial presented in JAMA Oncology and very uh, interesting data here. What is the importance of pre-RTPSA when you're deciding about ADT? Now on the left, you have uh, bicalutamide versus placebo when the PSA is less than 1.5, which we would classically consider as a salvage, uh, as early salvage. Um, and there is absolutely no difference in adding bicalutamide. But if you have a PSA that is uh, more than 1.5, you can see a large uh, significant overall survival difference uh, by adding bicalutamide. Uh, another uh, very interesting slide that I'd like to from the same paper, if you look at the overall survival in patients who have a PSA of 0.2 to 0.6, so less than 0.6, you can see here that adding, uh, so uh, the outcomes in this group favors the placebo actually. Uh, but overall, it, uh, for higher PSAs, uh, it favors the bicalutamide. And when you look at the all-cause mortality or the other cause mortality, there is a large uh, benefit in favor of the placebo. In other words, there is a harm by adding bicalutamide in patients who have a low uh, pre-RT PSA at salvage. So what do we do in practice? Uh, a lot of people have uh, uh, put in a lot of thought into these two trials and come up with this kind of a very nice framework or uh, recommendations. So it appears that based on these studies, if the, uh, if the PSA is low, less than 0.5 or point, less than 0.6, that is 0.1 to 0.5, which is what we would call classically early salvage, then irrespective of the Gleason, there is no 
uh, indication to give any form of ADT. It may even actually do harm. On the other hand, if the Gleason is high 8 to 10 and PSA is high, say certainly more than 1 or more than 1.5, uh, then there's a need to definitely need to give, to give ADT and probably long term ADT in this case two years. And all other patients in between should probably receive a short course of ADT. Now, one may ask, and this we often see in our practices, uh, can we give ADT alone? Uh, is, that, is that okay? PSA, PSA starts to rise and you give ADT alone. Well, it is not okay. Uh, this very recent Japanese trial uh, reported in the European Urology compared salvage hormone therapy alone with SRT plus uh, with or without uh, hormone therapy. And you see here, giving the radiotherapy in addition to hormone therapy significantly improves uh, proportion of uh, uh, reduces the number of treatment failures. So you cannot, it is not recommended to, uh, to give ADT alone in such patients. Which agents to choose? Uh, obviously the two different agents that have been studied are uh, uh, LHRH analog and bicalutamide, one for six months, another one for 150 uh, for two years. Um, each one have their own side effects. I'd like to bring out a couple of points here. Uh, six months ADT probably is easier with compliance as in the RTOG trials, there was only a 70% compliance with daily uh, bicalutamide. Uh, a testosterone recovery happens in about eight, 12 to 18 months, if weeks if you, if you do um, six months of ADT. Uh, with bicalutamide, one important but often overlooked issue is gynecomastia. I showed you 70% in the RTOG trial, nearly 100% in the French, uh, in the Japanese study. And it would be uh, wise to offer these patients breast bud uh, irradiation to prevent the, uh, if they are being considered for uh, bicalutamide long term. Uh, also, the trial showed that uh, un something that we, it's not very intuitive. Uh, the grade three to five cardiac effects with bicalutamide uh, were higher causing the all-cause mortality. So uh, it may not be that simple just to, uh, uh, to give bicalutamide on its own. The results of this trial are keenly awaited. That will tell us whether it should, it should be um, uh, six months or two years. That, that will probably uh, answer the du duration question uh, definitively. Thank you so much. Happy to take any questions. I think in the interest of time, we move to the next speaker and then we take the questions in the end. Okay. So I think Dr. Raghavan, uh, I would like to invite you for the next talk. Uh, thank you. Hopefully you can see my presence now and I'll just share the screen in a second. Uh, hopefully all of you can see my screen as well. Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Uh, good evening, all. It was an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, it is a very twisted uh, thinking process of uh, Ganesh and Raghu to give a topic like this to a surgeon, recurrence after radiation. And um, I, 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 we had a laugh about that. So, but I tried to do justice to it. And uh, it uh, gave an opportunity for me to read a lot about this as well. Uh, so in that uh, context, I have to say thank you to Ganesh for that. Uh, Vedang, please correct me if I'm wrong in anything. Um, so, 25 to 30 percent of the men with cancer receive radiation as a definitive treatment. Recurrence happens. Whatever we do, recurrence after treatment will happen, be it radical prostatectomy, be it radiation. It all depends upon finally boils down to cancer biology. In local recurrences after radiotherapy may increase uh, may increase the risk of developing local urinary symptoms and potential subsequent metastasis as well. So biochemical recurrence happens in 27 to 53% after definitive local, local therapy. Within 10 years, 20 to 40% post RP, 30 to 50% post RT. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, RTOG Astro Phoenix criteria, uh, a PSA increase of more than 2 nanogram per ml, higher than the PSA nadir value, regardless of the serum concentration of the nadir. So that's defined as a PSA failure or what we call biochemical recurrence. It's important to determine whether the recurrence has developed locally or in distant metastasis. 
and that impact is based will have an impact on whether the patient will develop distant metastasis prostate specific mortality overall mortality um the overall uh, survival rates are approximately 20% lower at 8 to 10 years follow up after primary rt okay now if you think about it whatever i'm presenting makes intuitive sense it is not that i'm doing something new the prognostic factors for recurrence are high biopsy grade high clinical stage short interval to biochemical failure high age and high initial pre sa treatment as i said everything makes sense the estimated 7 year psa relapse free survival for high risk patient is 75% meaning roughly 25 to 30% of the patients will develop recurrence biochemical recurrence in high risk category you know we are taking in context what happens in india as uh, srinivas also put in even though we don't have a strong data set to support what we say but from all our experience we know the the average patient that we treat belongs to the high risk category sadly we don't see t1c's and t2a's and a gleason 6 with one core positive in our practice so the average patient we are treating are high risk patients and our modality of treatment be it radi radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy roughly a third of those patients will have recurrence now if you take brachytherapy if you take brachytherapy and use brachytherapy for treating high risk uh, cases the recurrence is nearly 40% compared to the ebrt where it is 25 to 30 now proton this is a single uh, paper which says uh, it's very high but if you look at a collective uh, we looked at uh, for this presentation we looked at uh, multiple papers and put a average of all the recurrences for 3d CR, uh, CR, crt we have a 43% uh, uh recurrence rate of high risk cancer i'm talking about high risk and very high risk i'm not talking about low risk at all imrt gives the best results with 30% high re uh, recurrences and proton at 24% and an average sorry yeah now how to assess the response i mean as uh, sanjay very nicely put it now psma is now the standard of care for assessment of response bone scan and abdominal pelvic ct is not going to be useful for these patients at all um so psma pet in our practice at least we use only psma pet and psma pet is widely available in india now the next question is should we biopsy all these patients if we are going to plan any salvage therapy it's probably worthwhile to consider histological proof before we treat it even though for me this is a contentious point a personal note but if you look at the eau guideline i uh, this is recommended my contention about re biopsy is that when something is having a recurrence especially with the active psma pet showing a recurrence what could potentially go wrong there and do we have a biopsy system which can full proof give a, a positive result when there is a cancer we know the limitations of the biopsy and thirdly the biopsy increases the disturbance in the plane when we uh, plan to do salvage prostatectomy so these are my thoughts but the the ea guideline says you need to do a biopsy now if you look at the patterns of recurrence where does those where does those recurrence come local recurrence forms the bulk uh, is generally said after rt inevitably the recurrences are distant answer is no local recurrence if you take pelvic recurrence meaning local and lymph nodes 55 plus 21% nearly 70% patients have local recurrence um and if you take a uh, brachytherapy the once again the majority of the recurrences are local in nature uh, uh, almost 40% of the patient will have seminal vesicular involvement as well now um because of lack of time i'm going to move forward quickly so what are the what are the treatment option that was a question posed to me what are the treatment options for these patients we can wait we can do an rp we can give brachy to them we can re radiate cryo hypo and of course you know a, a panacea of cure adt we can do that as well so when to do watchful wait if the life expectancy is less than 10 years and who do not wish to undergo any second line curative treatments those are the patients of course the low risk bcrs where the psa delivery time is more than 1 year 
interval to biochemical fa failure is quite long and biopsy grade is less than 4 per RT. Now, the next is ADT. As I said, the most used and probably misused drug. We, as Vedang nicely put it, the complication rates of ADT is, is very high and we, we sometimes underestimate what the damage it can cause. The objective of ADT should be to improve overall survival, uh, postpone distant metastasis and improve quality of life. Salvage ADT has been associated with significantly better metastasis-free survival and disease-specific survival. But PSA doubling time is an important determinant. It is very useful only in patients when the PSA D DT is less than six months. If your PSA DT is one and a half, two years, putting them on ADT is nothing other than satisfying oneself rather than helping the patient. Uh, what is the timing to do it? We don't have a data to say that. I tend to, I tend to do uh, two consecutive PSAs and have a look at it. And if the PSA doubling time is short, I start them on ADT. That's what I do. Salvage RP. It's most underused procedure. Um, salvage RP after RT is, gives the best likelihood of achieving local control. However, this has to be weighed against the risk of adverse events, especially related to the fact that after ADT, there will be a lot of fibrosis, wound healing problems, difficult in dissection, rectal injury, and so on and so forth. Um, is it worth performing salvage prostatectomy? There is a literature review for people who are interested. Um, there are only the, the, patient, uh, the patients that have been studied includes 18. For the one large series by Chade is 404 patients. So there has been a lot of mixed view on that. Um, I've just summarized this one slide to tell where the story is standing at this point of time. The median follow-up is, we'll take the highest one. The median follow-up is uh, 55 months and organ confined disease was found in really half of the patient. The positive surgical margin in about uh, one fourth of the patient and lymph node involvement in about 20% of the patients. But, but biochemical recurrence free survival is only 37% in a large series. Compared to a smaller series, it is as high as 75%. Uh, so that, the reason is there is no body of evidence for us because salvage RP is something people tread so carefully and are very choosy in picking it up. And hence, there is no big body of evidence for that. Uh, the complications are not as bad as what we thought in the past. The rectal injury rates are about 20%. Um, and uh, the, the patients do are incontinent almost takes almost one year for recovery of continence to happen. Um, just for the students, the surgical steps are extremely, uh, you have to be very careful. The whole thing is the difficulty in finding the recto prostatic plane and the apex, the ability of you to preserve a very good urethral length to do a, a good anastomosis and triple check the rectum the DRE, air filling, methylene blue, and sigmoidoscopy. Um, it has to be performed by people who uh, can do it regularly, and using a lab or a robot will add to the, uh, uh, the value because of the good uh, uh, magnification. Uh, and the ideal candidate for surgery, as per the EAU guideline, patients with low comorbidity, life expectancy of more than 10 years, pre-SRP, PSA is less than 10, and biopsy is uh, less than two or three, no nodal involvement. Initial staging is T1 or two. So if you pick up like that, you achieve an excellent BCR uh, with 73%. But if you don't pick it up, the BCR rates are terrible. So meaning that case selection is the, is the clue here. Now, brachytherapy um, uh, is the chance of cure after uh, for using salvage brachytherapy is very low. Uh, you can use it. But it is um, the, the overall survival estimated at 92%. BCR is about 51%. But there is no robust evidence of the risk of AEs after brachytherapy. Only in experienced centers, they are doing it. Re-radiation. I mean, previously, re-radiation is, is almost said as a taboo. But now with the advent of SBRT, re-radiation is being hugely discussed. And the biochemical disease-free survival is about 60%. Local free, uh, uh, recurrence free rate is 94%. Um, so it seems to be quite good as an option to be considered, especially using an SBRT as a tool. 
I'm going to tell about cryo and then quickly move on to HIFO. Literally pushing my slides just to say that don't even bother about them. They are only, uh, uh, they are there with a lot of complication, rectoerythral fistula rates, and I, therefore I'm not going to dwell too much about them. I'm going to move forward and finally present the EAU guidelines. When you have biochemical recurrence after radiotherapy, extreme case selection is important, especially when you do radical prostatectomy. Should be performed only by experienced people. Uh, you can offer HIFU or cryo or whatever only on a clinical trial setting. And uh, salvage treatment, do not offer patients who have M0 disease, who have a PSA doubling time of more than 12 months because ADT has its complication. So to summarize, whatever I presented is from the experience and the publication. It is just a guidance. It is important to tailor the treatment to that individual. You may have a 75 year fit well patient and you may have a 75 completely unfit patient. It is up to the clinician and the MDT to decide what will be the best treatment course for them. Thank you so much for the time. I want to say Vedang, salvage RP is grossly underused procedure. So considering all the discussion that we had in high risk patient, Perhaps, and, and the fact that one third of the patients with high risk will have a local recurrence, would it be wise to consider RP as a first line of treatment for these patients? That is just a teaser. Thank you very much. Uh, Raghavan, if I may, if I may uh, you just showed that if you choose the high risk patients for salvage RP, they do miserably. So, <laughs> if you choose the, so salvage if, RP. So my yeah. point is, do the primary RP for them first and keep, and I, I, and I go with uh, Srini saying that, that have adjuvant RP for them. That is a debate for another day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So just one question, Dr. Raghavan. Yes, sir. How do you select your patient for uh, a salvage uh, RP? I mean, what would you look at the patient and say, okay, this patient, I, I will do a salvage RP. Would you base your decision on the... Uh, ESA, the disease profile, the patient profile. Okay. Sir, I've done six salvage RPs so far. Um, and, and that I had one uh, rectal injury as well. Uh, the criteria I keep is that the PSA doubling time should be low. Number one. Number two, the patient should be fit and well. No comorbidities. Uh, the patients I've done are inevitably between 60 and 65, touching 70. And that's it. Not more than that. Meaning that they don't have comorbidities, they will be worth to live that life to gain the benefit of what I'm trying to do there. Thirdly, the, it should be completely organ-confined disease. Previously, before the full advent of PSMA PET, which we have now, I used to use MRI and CT both. Nowadays, I'm using PSMA PET as a criteria. And I counsel, counsel, at least four or five sessions of counseling and tell them very clearly, you're going to take at least one year to regain continence. I tell them honestly, you're not a, a radiation. They become touchy-feely about it. They think, oh, should I go back to the same place again? That's, as I said, it's a big MDT discussion. You put it, you get a second opinion. You go around the place. Patient inevitably goes around two, three months before they take a call on these things. Yes, that's one that's last question I think uh, I would like to ask both Dr. Srinivas and Dr. Vedang. A quick question. So if for Indian settings, post-operative settings, uh, post radical prostatectomy which trial would be the most suitable is it the timing of the radiotherapy the need of adjuvant or salvage rt or is it the hormone therapy timing and the you know amount both of you can say as a one liner i think if you are talking about uh, uh, the uh, post operative i think what srinivas showed in multiple high risk patients whether we should do adjuvant or salvage would be my I agree with uh, Vedam. That's the most important trial that to be done with us. Srinivas? I kind of agree with that. Agree with that. Um, probably, I, if, if, I, if it's possible, I would like to answer both. He's diplomatic. Shall we move to the <laughs> we leave it for Thank the you all. Thank can you so I, much. Can I ask Dr. Vedang one question? Yeah. Uh, yes, Dr. Sir. Vedang, what, what would be your what is your preferred form of ADT? I mean, do the trials show for a salvage RT situation? I mean, the trials do mention bicolitamide. Do you use it in practice or 
uh, no sir uh, we give uh, generally two injections of lhrh analog six months so analog in, would be in patients who have a psa uh, who have missed the early salvage rt boat and are above 0.5 Vedang, one question, quick question. In your entire presentation, uh, you know, what is the duration of ADD that you would use when you choose to irradiate uh, uh, intermediate or high-risk lymph node positive patients? So, in in that category, what is the duration of ADD you would use? You are talking of post two years. Post yes, please. Yes. So, uh, two years. Two years. So in all intermediate and high risk both two years so once they are not positive i would irradiate i would uh, use for about two years okay we move on yeah i think we can move on to the next session thank you uh, dr hemang bakshi who is a chief uro oncologist at uh, amdabad uh, hcg cancer center uh, dr gagan saini who is the chief radiation oncologist in max group of hospitals and rahul krishnatri who is a professor in radiation oncology at tmh we go to the third session where i invite uh, dr tb uraj chief uro oncologist and the director of robotic uh, surgery at kdh uh, kokila ben hospital mumbai to uh, invite and welcome uh, dr lawrence clarks thank you uraj thank you thank you ganesh uh, can you hear me yes yeah thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to introduce professor clots so is professor clots online okay yes. so now uh, it's my pleasure to uh, hi good, good evening from here i think good morning there thank you yeah good morning yeah. is correct so now uh, i will i want to i would like to uh, introduce uh, professor clarts so he is uh, currently working as professor of surgery at the university of toronto holds the sunnybrook chair of prostate, prostate cancer research he is the founder and chairman of the canadian urological research consortium and he is also the chair of global geo oncology group dr clarts is widely published Euro oncologist with over 350 publications and several books. His main research interest is in prostate cancer. I think we have uh, read many articles uh, from Professor Clarts. So I, I remember one of them was the uh, Clarts analysis or delta analysis in uh, a maximum antigen blockade. I think it was eye opening uh, for us uh, quite a uh, few years back. So we used to read about that. And he was also ex president Canadian and uh, Urological Association. he got uro oncology training from uh, ms cases in new york uh, as a special fellow in uro oncology and tumor biology this is a very brief introduction of professor clots i think he has got uh, it's very difficult to introduce him in a short period and i think in the next 30 minutes or so i think we'll be having a, a complete uh, overview of uh, about uh, androgen deprivation therapy welcome dr clots and uh, over to you thanks very much uh, and um It's nice to see friends and colleagues even if it's at a distance. Uh we're all living through a very extraordinary time. Uh this is Toronto looking at its best right now. It's cold and miserable and cloudy, but uh it's a beautiful city. I welcome you welcome you to visit. My disclosure is just to say I've worked with most of the pharmaceutical companies in this area over the years. So we've all we're all preoccupied with COVID. and for a while it seemed like that was the only the disease that mattered and uh i think probably it was uh, comparable in india to canada a lot of shutdown uh, elective surgery canceled nothing else seemed to matter but just to emphasize that we will move beyond covid and prostate cancer has been with us uh, since the beginning and this i just thought by way of introduction paleo pathologic study showing that metastatic prostate cancer was present in skeletons going back uh, more than 3000 years so it's here it's been with us uh, since the dawn of history and it will continue and i don't think we need to make any pathology any any apologies about talking about diseases other than covid so we've heard quite a bit about hormone therapy i thought it's been a great series of talks i really enjoyed it uh, but just to emphasize how far we've come in the last decade despite the fact that the hormone therapy story goes back now 80 years the first publication in 1941 uh so what's happened in the last 10 years much better understanding of the mechanisms of castration resistance 
multiple pathways for this, which uh, I think most are familiar with, uh, autocrine antigen synthesis, mutations, splice variants, and so on. Uh, the concept of resistance, the concept of resistance induced, uh, treatment induced resistance, that uh, there was a, a long debate in the field was castration resistance present in a small proportion of cells that were then selected for, or did it was it acquired over time? And both are both take place, but by far the most important one is the uh, treatment induced resistance, and there's mul multiple mechanisms for this. Uh, it's been about 13 years since Nancy Keating reported the metabolic effects of ADT particularly metabolic syndrome, I'll come back to that. We have data on intermittent therapy. I'll discuss that briefly. We heard a great talk about testosterone levels. Uh, I'm not going to address that again because I think it's been covered very well and I agree very much with the comments that were made that, that the goal of ADT is to get castrate levels of testosterone. If they're not fully suppressed, you should change your treatment to try and get them fully suppressed. Uh, the last few years, we've had the LHRH antagonists, particularly Degarelix or Firmagon, and some recent data, which I'll focus on, on the cardiovascular benefits compared to the antagonists. And finally, of course, we're now in the era of the ARATs, androgen receptor axis targeted therapies. It's a very exciting development. And one thing that it's, it's taught us clearly is that even in castrate resistant prostate cancer, the androgen axis, the antigen receptor axis is still targetable and very critically important. So I'm going to just begin talking about five different interventions in men going on AT that are not that well known and that I think all of which are supported by data that improves their quality of life and, and surv even survival. Statins, bone target agents, metformin, exercise, and intermittent therapy. So first, the statin story. Now, this is the well-known diagram of androgen synthesis. There's three pathways. The cholesterol pathway is the primary one that goes through androstenedione to testosterone and then to DHT. The so-called backdoor pathway, which is important in CRPC, this is the pathway of intracrine androgen synthesis where the prostate cells make their own androgen, it bypasses testosterone. That's why it's called the backdoor pathway. We know that the enzymes involved in this pathway, like AKR1C2, are upregulated up to a thousand fold in CRPC. This is the pathway that's blocked with abiraterone, for example. And then the one I just want to focus on briefly is the adrenal pathway, which makes androstene diol and a dihydroepiandrosterone. Now, this is interesting because DHEA serves as a precursor for testosterone in the castrate state, and it's converted to testosterone into cell, intracellularly. But unlike testosterone, which diffuses into all cells because it's a lipophilic molecule, dihydro has the two hydro, hydroxy groups. It's, it's a polar molecule. It needs a transporter to get into the cell. And this is where it gets more interesting. Uh, uh, the transporter, it turns out, is shared with statins. So statins compete for this transporter, which is called SLCBO2. The name doesn't matter. And it turns out that in now there's, there's at least three studies that I know of that show that in men given statins with ADT, the time to uh, progression, the, the cause-specific survival, and even overall survival is improved. Here's one from last year, uh, urologic oncology, a retrospective study, but very large, 87,000 men. You can see the Kaplan-Meyer's very significant benefit just by adding a statin. And then this one was actually just published by our group a couple of weeks ago. And it's basically, uh, this was in the PR7, which was the intermittent versus continuous trial in men with biochemical failure that I led uh, about a decade ago, 
was uh, more than 1,400 men. And this was a secondary analysis with long-term follow-up of statins versus no statins. And again, overall survival, prostate cancer specific survival. There's not a huge effect difference here, uh, but it's because it's a large trial, statistically significant. And um, time to progression or time to re, uh, um, reinstituting ADT in the intermittent arm also improved. So it looks like what's happening, statins act on multiple pathways, but this, this um, pathway where the statin is blocking the uptake of the adrenal androgens, which serve as a precursor for testosterone in the castrate environment, looks to be quite important. I think all patients on ADT should be on a statin. Second, bone mineral density. Uh, we give lip service to this. Uh, every group recommends vitamin D and calcium. There's absolutely no evidence that vitamin D and calcium has any impact on preventing loss of bone mineral density in men on ADT. We know it's about 2% in the first year, which is significant in terms of the risk of fragility fractures. And there are now a number of studies. This is a randomized study that I led a few years ago. Uh, just one pill of Eledronate per week, 70 milligram pill per week, resulted in a 2% gain in bone mineral density after one year compared to a 2% loss. So overall, it's a 4% difference, very significant. Uh, there's now a number of studies that have looked at this with various agents, zoledronic acid, denosumab, Eledronate, there's several. The results are very consistent that there's a, an improvement in bone mineral density. It's not surprising. Uh, we should be doing this routinely. I, I frankly don't understand, given that we know this effect occurs, we know it's clinically important that these men are at risk for fragility fractures, particularly if they're elderly. One pill a week reverses it. And I, I do this routinely in patients on long-term ADT. And the third one that I also think is kind of neglected is metformin. Metformin is a very appealing drug these days. It looks like a kind of a health promotion drug. It prevents diabetes, results in some weight loss, but in particular in men on ADT. We know that insulin resistance, hyperglycemia is a very common problem in men on ADT. It's induced by the therapy. And here we have two randomized studies, uh, both small around 60 patients, but both strongly positive because the effect is pretty dramatic. So with the metformin, you get a lower glucose levels, less diabetes, uh, less weight gain, lower weight, uh, waist circumference, a lower BMI, and so on. Both the studies were positive. They both showed the same thing. Uh, metformin does not cause problems in non-diabetics. It doesn't cause hypoglycemia. This is a relatively low dose, 500 milligrams uh, TID or, or around 1,000 milligrams a day in the other study. So uh, again, this one hasn't been supported by randomized trials as of yet although we are doing one in Canada at the moment in men on ADT, metformin versus placebo. But uh, you know, there, there's two studies out there that are positive. I think it's very appealing. And finally, exercise. If exercise were a pill, we would all take it. Exercise is good for everybody, but there's at least uh, eight different pathways, actually nine on this slide, eight different pathways by which uh, exercise can favorably influence the uh, molecular genetics, the epigenetics, the uh, cytokine environment, immune function in men with prostate cancer. And aside from that, in men who are on ADT, it reduces the weight gain, the sarcopenia, the loss of uh, muscle mass. So you really need to encourage these patients to do this. I mentioned, uh, I'm, I'll just, uh, I mentioned smoking cessation the thing, single most cost-effective intervention in all of medicine. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, as a physician, uh, you often, you may be the only physician the patient is seeing as his prostate cancer specialist. Uh, you really should take two minutes. That has been shown to actually make a difference in terms of the patient's uh, smoking practice. Once they're diagnosed with cancer, they're very receptive to that message. 
Okay, I mentioned this is PR7, the, the large intermittent versus continuous trial. It showed absolutely no difference in overall survival between the two arms. This was in men with biochemical failure. Uh, there's now been about 10 randomized trials involving 7,000 patients comparing intermittent therapy to lifelong therapy. They, some use three months, some use 10 months of induction, some use six. It's all over the map. Uh, all of them showed comparable overall and cause specific survival. Not one of these 10 trials has shown that intermittent therapy is worse. There is one equivocal study, which was SWOG 9346, published by Maha Hussein. Uh, both this and the PR7 were published in 2012 in the New England Journal, and the results were inconclusive. This was in metastatic disease. Uh, it's a long story as to what 9346 really showed. Uh, I think in practice, because this is, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but I just think intermittent therapy is a way to reduce the side effects of ADT for men who are being treated with biochemical failure only or regional nodal metastasis. I think it should be the standard of care. It certainly is in Canada. You save money, you save morbidity. There's no difference in outcome. For metastatic patients, it's got a limited role, but there is quite good data that in patients who have a complete PSA response less than 0.2, that some of these patients will have a prolonged off-treatment interval. Uh, some will not. Some will progress right away. You put them back on treatment, there's no harm done. But there are some patients who can be off treatment for years, and they clearly benefit. Now, of course, we're in the era of combined therapy for uh, metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer with the ARAD or docetaxel. And you might say, well, does intermittent therapy really have a role in these patients? I think it does because they get their six cycles of docetaxel. They have a complete response. They're well. They may have dramatic regression of their metastatic disease. Uh, all the data suggests that be these patients do just as well if you stop treatment for a period of time if they've had a complete biochemical response. And the idea is to treat till the PSA is less than 0.2. Now, um, we did a randomized study comparing four to 10 months of induction therapy in men in ADT. And in fact, there was no difference in outcome in terms of time to progression. So you don't need to treat for a prolonged period. You treat till they have a complete PSA response less than 0.2. That might be as little as three months, particularly in PSA failure patients. If it takes longer, you continue and there still may be a role. Uh, we heard about testosterone breakthrough and I'm not gonna go over that again. This is common in men on LHRH agonists. Uh, it does seem to matter. Yeah, this is, this, is the, uh, this is the intermittent study that I mentioned where we randomized the patients between four and 10 months of Firmagon and just emphasize there were no difference in the off-treatment interval despite the 10-month group having far more duration of exposure to ADT than the four-month group. And no difference in time to testosterone recovery in these patients as well. Uh, so I'm gonna focus the remainder of my comments on this cardiovascular story, the agonist versus the antagonist. And the first key point to emphasize is that men who have prostate cancer are at risk for cardiovascular disease, about 2% per year. Uh, men who are on ADT, the risk approximately doubles to around 4% per year. By cardiologists, this is considered a high risk group, uh, anything above 2% per year. And you know, I think everyone in the field knows the commonest cause of death in men with non-metastatic prostate cancer is cardiovascular disease. Now, the data on this link is not as robust as one might think. So this shows the population-based observation studies. So you can see the strength of these studies is they involve huge numbers of patients, more than 100, 119,000 patients, and the message is pretty consistently positive that men who've been on ADT have a higher risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality with a hazard ratio about 1.2. 
makes sense. We know these men have developed metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is associated with obesity, with change in lipid profile, with uh, insulin resistance, at least three factors that contribute to cardiovascular disease. Uh, the problem is, this has been also studied in randomized trials. Now, of course, these are much smaller, total of 2,200 patients in these nine or 10 studies, but the signal disappears. Where is the um, effect of hormone therapy on uh, major cardiovascular events? It was not seen in these studies. Now, why is that? And probably the reason is, and again, this is a fairly long story, but the reason is when you design a clinical trial, you have inclusion and exclusion criteria, and almost always uh, uncontrolled or very significant cardiovascular disease is an exclusion criteria. So part of what you're seeing here is what's called a healthy cohort effect, that patients in randomized trials tend to be healthier than patients in population studies. And you'll see why in this particular case, this is so relevant. Now, I think everyone's familiar with the agonists and the antagonists, just to emphasize the agonists work by causing release of transmitter, which then results in, uh, the, the transmitter is, is completely depleted and therefore further um, agonist results in persistent depletion of the transmitter. And after the surge, you get castrate levels of testosterone and low levels of LH. Uh, the agonist is a blocker. So it's, it's, although it's also a decapeptide, it works in a fundamentally different way. It doesn't cause release of transmitter. It blocks the receptor. And one effect of that is, of course, no surge. The other is that uh, FSH is reduced dramatically as well as LH, which doesn't happen with the agonist to nearly the same degree. And this is, uh, I, I was very involved in the pivotal registration trial of this, uh, of Degarelix. This goes back a few years, but this was a trial that led to the drug being approved. About 600 patients randomized between Degarelix and Luprolide, and, you know, sustained suppression of testosterone with both drugs, of course, the, no surge. And, you know, this is an advantage. The surge is an unwanted effect. But I must say at the time, uh, really no one thought this was such a big deal. We blocked the surge routinely with antiandrogen. It's not at all clear how clinically relevant the surge is other than in patients who have uh, very advanced uh, vertebral metastases, for example. And then some data started to emerge, and I was involved in these uh, studies that uh, tried to extract some more information from the multiple randomized studies that have been done comparing Degarelix to Luprolide in the course of getting the drug approved. There were about six. And uh, none of these were powered for a cardiovascular endpoint. Th these are the six studies. You can see none of them were more than one year. They varied in terms of size from the CS21. My study was about 600. Some of them are really small studies, for example, in BPH. Uh, but, and here was the cardiovascular data. So overall, there was about a, uh, a one-third reduction in cardiovascular events. These are major cardiovascular events or death from cardiovascular disease by one year. And this is ab an absolute maybe two 0.5% difference. It's nothing to get too excited about, although the trend is kind of interesting. But when you pull out the, uh, the less healthy patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, it's quite a dramatic effect. So these patients are at risk. About 15% in the uh, Luprolide group uh, had an event by one year, and there was a 50% reduction with an absolute risk reduction of 7%, which it now becomes more clinically relevant. Now, why should this be? Both of these drugs work by lowering testosterone. The testosterone causes metabolic syndrome. Why should there be a difference? It was counterintuitive. But there are some other explanations, and both of these other explanations now have had quite a bit of preclinical and clinical support. The FSH story and the 
the presence of LHRH receptors in endothelial plaques, macrophages, and T cells. So I'll just go into this in a little bit of detail. So as I mentioned, one difference between the antagonist and the agonist is FSH is not suppressed more than about 30% with the agonists, where it's suppressed about 90 to 95% with the antagonist. Now, who cares? FSH is a hormone that's important if you're in the infertility world or if you are treating uh, postmenopausal women for, for kind of postmenopausal syndrome. But other than that, I don't think uh, we uh, pay much attention to it. But it turns out that probably what's relevant is the FSH to testosterone ratio. So where you have high testosterone, uh, the, the FSH isn't that important. But where the FSH, where the testosterone is low, the FSH becomes a much more important hormone. And it has been implicated in almost every aspect of uh, a prostate cancer and ADT. So here's a New England Journal study from uh, 10 years ago that showed that uh, the neovascularity in men with uh, advanced prostate cancer expressed the FSH receptor. It was activated by FSH, and it concluded that recept FSH receptor signaling can cause uh, cell proliferation. FSH is involved in loss of bone mineral density. It's thought that it is probably the major, major hormone responsible for osteoporosis in postmenopausal women, increases osteoclastogenesis, NF-kappa beta, etc. cetera. Uh, this is an absolutely fascinating study. This is Nature from a couple of years ago. Uh, these were transgenic mice engineered to develop rapid obesity and atherosclerosis. In this study, all they did was give a blocking FSH antibody. That's what you see in the red. The green is the control antibody. Blocking FSH in these animals resulted in prevention of the obesity to a large degree. You compare these, uh, the red is the fat, uh, uh, decrease in uh, fat content in uh, lean body, um, in, uh, improvement in lean uh, muscle mass and so on, really dramatic. And then you have uh, our situation of the, the different kinds of ADT. This is comparing Degorelix to Anantone or Luprolide as used in the lab. Less fat accumulation, which is the purple. Castration is worse, by the way, because you get high levels of FSH. Uh, orchidectomy is associated with a higher rate of myocardial infarction, uh, probably due to the high FSH. Uh, one more study, again, orchidectomy versus LHRH agonist, just to support this FSH uh, hypothesis that there's more weight gain, more fat mass, et cetera, with orchidectomy. So that's the FSH story. I think it's pretty convincing. Uh, and then the other aspect of this is the um, plaque destabilization. So uh, medical students these days learn that Coronary artery disease is actually an inflammatory disease because the endothelial plaques have inflammatory cells. And uh, these cells, if they're stimulated, can destabilize the plaque and result in uh, uh, thrombosis and myocardial infarction. And it turns out these, these inflammatory cells have LHRH receptors and when these are activated, they stimulate T cell expansion and plaque destabilization. And this cartoon shows this. So here you have um, the inflammatory cells in the endothelial plaque. If you give an agonist, you stimulate uh, inflammation, plaque destabilization. Antagonist, you have no activation of these receptors at all. It's an inhibitor and you don't get the, the same effect. And, the, and um, one more preclinical slide. This is from uh, transgenic, these are some transgenic mice uh, studies that I was involved with comparing Luprolide to Degorelix. This is um, necrotic plaque area at the aortic root. 
So these animals get rapid atherosclerosis, essentially blocked by degorelics compared to luprolide, just supporting this hypothesis of the uh, plaque, uh, the, the um, prevention of the uh, expansion of those immune cells in the endothelial plaques. Now there's some clinical data on this. This comes from David Margell in Tel Aviv. He took patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So that, that's the key point. This is an effect in men who have endothelial plaques pre-existing. Of course, probably most of us do have endothelial plaques, but they're more, more substantial and they're more at risk if they've got a prior history. Um, so these patients were randomized between agonist and antagonist, very significant difference, although it's a small study in terms of time to the first major uh, coronary event or cardiovascular uh, uh, e event, strongly positive. And it also showed to support the FSH story that the patients who failed to have a significant fall in FSH, more than 60%, had about a seven times greater risk of cardiovascular events than the ones who had fully suppressed FSH. So I don't know which of these two mechanisms is more important. They're probably both relevant. Now, anyone in this field, I think, saw the New England Journal publication that came out a month or two ago of Relagelix, the oral uh, antagonist. Uh, it was 930 patients, a two to one randomization. This is just a summary that there was very good suppression of uh, testosterone. That was the primary endpoint with the relagelix compared to luprolide. And this is the adverse events. So here you have an oral antagonist. And sure enough, if you look at the major adverse cardiac events or MACE events, uh, relagelix versus luprolide, uh, a significant reduction, particularly in the patients who had a prior history, 3.6% with relagilix, 18% with luprolide. Now, are we all gonna switch to the oral drug? Too soon to say, I mean, uh, relagilix was just approved by the FDA, I believe last week. It's not available in Canada, I've never used it. Uh, I think it's gonna have an impact uh, most people would prefer a pill to an injection, but uh, compliance may be an issue. So we know with breast cancer drugs, compliance is quite poor. If you think that testosterone microsurges are important, that lack of compliance may be a problem and hard to monitor. If you have the option of a very infrequent depot, some patients may prefer that to a pill. Uh, the cost is uncertain, it's not going to be cheap, and we have no long-term data. So I would say the jury is still out on this. It certainly is a, a welcome development to have a pill instead of an injection. So I call this is to wrap it up, the A, B, C, D, E, F for men on ADT. The A is awareness of the various cardiovascular and other metabolic effects. ASA, if they have prior cardiovascular disease, the B is for bone health. I like alendronate 70 milligrams a week. The C is for the cholesterol, the statins, uh, 10 to 20 milligrams of Lipitor or Crestor, and uh, smoking cessation. The D is for uh, multiple things, intermittent therapy to discontinue the drug, uh, diabetes, metformin, uh, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day, exercise, everyone should do it. And finally, for the men with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, consider uh, the LHRH antagonist. So uh, I'll, I'll stop on that note. I know we're a little bit over time, and I, I, uh, I can take questions for a minute or two. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I, I invite uh, Dr. Jagdish Kulkarni, sir, to carry on it further in this session. Well, uh, Dr. Klotz, we still remember we, we, we were together in Spain. Uh, yes. Yeah, if you recollect that. Well, thank you very much. As has been, it has been a masterclass and talking about prostate cancer and ADT. Well, well there are several takeaways as from your lecture. Uh, but just to give you a few, which is, uh, which is the news to me, is the use of statins and other things. You talked about metformin, which is also a very good thing. And you also told us A, B, C, D, E, F now. Now, we want to go to Z, perhaps, 
which is the z, z score of the <laughs> bone mineral density well, i think uh, well it has been a great uh, to have you it's always been a great pleasure to have you and listen to you because you combine both clinical as well as the basic science to the maximum level thank you very much thank you. Uh, are there thank any you. questions uh, perhaps uh, can i ask a question dr kulkarni yes, folks yes, i'm i i have to apologize we're running over and i have to run so i can take okay. one question but okay. i'm going to have question? to leave in about 2 minutes uh, what, what is your yeah. view what is your view on uh, transdermal uh, estrogens that are now coming up even as part of stampede yeah so this is the patch uh okay. you know it hasn't caught on uh i think that they get gynecomastia which can be uh you know is is something that doesn't happen with the lhrh drugs uh the main appeal i think is cost the yeah. oral estrogens cause very significant cardiovascular disease right. and we did we tried to block that with uh with an anticoagulant it didn't work so i i think the patch definitely has an appeal uh particularly where cost is a major consideration but you know the patient will get gynecomastia well thank you very much dr claude it has been great to have you thank you all right much. thank you great to see you all and i hope we can see you see each other soon in person right thank you bye bye this this covid is a real drag <laughs> yeah thank you all right bye bye everybody bye, -bye. bye, -bye. thanks uh, uh i invite uh, dr vedan for the session 4 to introduce to our next speaker and carry on with the session well thank you ganesh uh, i will not take time uh, welcome uh, dr amar kishan he is uh, assistant professor and the chief of uh, gu radiation oncology at ucla san francisco but that's just on paper in practice and the real world in the in our field he's a real uh, rock star if i may say and uh, i think uh, uh, good to see you amar and i uh, would love to hear you talk about how to choose the right management for gleason and grade 5 uh, cancers uh, today well, th thank you for the wonderful introduction and it's a real honor to be uh, invited to speak here uh, with your group i would really look forward to it um so i'm going to be talking again about the optimal management of gleason grade group 5 disease you know as we know uh, historically only 5 to 10% of patients have actually had gleason grade group 5 disease that proportion is likely increasing over time due to targeted biopsies but nonetheless it's a small minority of prostate cancer patients most cohort studies and trials have reported outcomes for patients with gleason grade group 5 Uh, grouped with uh, grade group 4 so gleason score 8 to 10 we have very little prospect of sunday pudundam meeting what is that uh, please carry on please carry on okay uh, we have a uh, very little data that's specifically for gleason grade group 5 that are prospective um, and this is despite the fact that you know gleason grade group 5 is a known adverse uh, prognostic feature even within high risk prostate cancer we know that gleason grade group 5 disease does worse Nonetheless, uh, the recommendation is to treat it the same as other um, types of high-risk prostate cancer. So I'm going to go over first kind of some comparative effectiveness research, looking at different treatments. These are retrospective. I'm going to talk about work on ADT and how that plays a role in Gleason grade group five disease, and then touch a little bit on maybe some ideas on how to optimally manage this, and finally uh, some biologic heterogeneity in this group. So. Um uh, one of the largest studies done in this space was uh, run by our group as published a couple of years ago it's a multi-institutional retrospective study of 1809 men with Gleason grade group 5 disease who either got surgery radiation with uh, just standard external or EBRT plus brachy boost between 2000 to 2013 so a fairly modern cohort you can see here there's clearly imbalances in Uh, demographic features between these patients the surgical patients are are much younger they have a lower burden of disease so we attempted to account for this but why a propensity score adjustment and you can see on this column here uh, it's a much more balanced population after we use that methodology nonetheless there are some very important notes on the treatments
did validate our prior results. If you look at the max RT group, that's the Brady boost group, has the lowest GCSM and a very low um, all-cause mortality uh, as well. But what they found was that specific permutations of surgery, maximal RP particularly, um, tended to perform pretty well too. So did adjuvant radiation. The other surgery-based treatments, so surgery and surgery with adjuvant ADT, but no radiation, did not perform as well. So max RP is what they proposed uh, would have the highest plausibility of equivalence with maximum RP. So what, what is this saying? This is saying, you know, if you're going to treat these patients with surgery, consider surgery, adjuvant radiation, and uh, adjuvant ADT. And we, we heard about this in a, in a very good talk uh, just, a, just an hour ago or so. Um, and so I won't belabor this point, but as was discussed, very few patients on these seminal new um, post-op trials actually had Gleason grade group four to five disease. And that's four to five. So the Gleason grade group five proportion is going to be even less, at, at most half of this, and probably less than that. So I don't know that we can say for sure that this debate of adjuvant versus early salvage is settled for sure um, in uh, patients with Gleason grade group five disease. Now, the toxicity is different. We see that toxicity is worse if you do adjuvant radiation. That might be uh, a reason to add ADT to the mix by some time before coming in with the radiation. But I, I think this question is still open. So, you know, how can we summarize this part? Well, EBRT plus brachy with a median ADT duration of 12 months appears to have a significantly improved efficacy over RP without a strict multimodality protocol or EBRT, uh, although high dose CBRT with 24 months of ADT or more may have comparable PCSM outcomes, but sometimes there's a problem in terms of compliance or, or use of those durations of ADT. If you're going to go with surgery, surgery with immediate RT and ADT may have comparable efficacy, but the comparison was a shorter duration of ADT, which is, which is important to note as a limitation there. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about ADT. So due to the highly de-differentiated appearance and aggressive behavior of Gleason grade group 5 prostate cancer, some have said that, you know, maybe it's inherently less responsive to ADT. But is there really, you know, good evidence of that? So we did a, a network meta-analysis. We obtained individual patient data for 992 men with Gleason grade group 5 disease, uh, enrolled on six classical uh, trials. And we looked at ADT response as a function of Gleason grade group. And this is 992 men across six trials, only about 400 at Gleason grade group 5 disease. So, you know, it's a rare entity. The impact of different durations of ADT uh, was evaluated, um, basically looking at overall survival, prostate cancer specific survival, and DMFS. And I'm showing you here the forest plots for Gleason um, grade group 4 versus Gleason grade group 5 for overall survival. What we see in the Gleason grade group 4 comp uh, group if you're adding long-term ADT or short-term ADT, you're significantly improving overall survival. Lifelong ADT, which was only studied in one trial, I'll grant you that, did not improve uh, overall survival. But when you look at Gleason grade group five, a different pattern. The over, uh, overall survival is only improved with lifelong ADT. It is not improved by a long-term ADT or short-term ADT. So there is a difference. There's a significant difference in the response to ADT. If instead you compare the prognosis of Gleason grade group five versus Gleason grade group four, I'm not showing that forest, forest plot, we would show that overall there's worse mortality with Gleason grade group five, as we would expect. That worse mortality is blunted when you add longer durations of ADT. When you're doing shorter durations of ADT or no ADT, it's clearly a much worse prognosis comparing Gleason grade group five versus four. So in fact, Gleason grade group five disease is responsive to ADT, but it might be a question of how responsive it is to ADT. This is uh, supported by a, a registry-based study that was run by another group uh, they looked at patients, you know, with a variable use of ADT or not. So they did not have duration information, and it was not a prospective study. But what they found was a significant overall survival benefit in Gleason 8 patients at large, in, in the U.S. population at large, getting ADT with radiation, no longer significant when looking at Gleason 9 or Gleason 10. And there was this uh, interaction term of significance. So I think this is a, a supportive study, but the caveat here is we don't have information on the length uh, of ADT. So what are we what are we seeing? You know, it, it's not correct that Gleason grade group 5 is not responsive to ADT. Otherwise, lifelong ADT would not have worked, but it does. And even long-term ADT can blunt the adverse prognostic impact of Gleason grade group 5. So it is responsive. 
but perhaps it's not as responsive. And I think the registry database confirms that because lifelong ADT is very unlikely to be used. We already know that long-term ADT is unlikely to be used. So probably here, what they were looking at with use of ADT is mostly short-term ADT, uh, or maybe very short durations, you know, 18 months or something, and that would not have impacted these patients potentially. So how can we potentially, you know, kind of tie this together? If we imagine someone is treated for prostate cancer, we can say what happens subsequently might be described by four states, okay? A relapse-free state, they're cured. That's obviously where we want people to be. Sometimes people pass away of other causes. Sometimes people get a local failure. Sometimes people develop a distant metastasis. If someone is getting a distant metastasis from a relapse-free state, we might think maybe that was an occult metastasis that was present at the time of treatment and was not managed and it has presented itself. If someone develops a local failure and then a distant metastasis, that's what's considered this second wave hypothesis uh, of, 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 of local recurrence seeding distant metastasis. And in many ways, this has driven a lot of the studies in prostate cancer. Um, dose escalation, for example, the whole use of a break key boost, it's all done to optimize local control and prevent this from happening because very few people actually die of a local failure. Um, even the argument that had been present for years to do surgery first is because surgery has a very good local control, right? So we wanted to see whether we could actually detect this phenomenon uh, in prospectively studied patients. So we went back to the six randomized trials. We broke up, you know, by ADT duration and actually just looked years zero to five, how many patients that are getting distant metastasis are coming from a relapse-free state, which we might hypothesize are occult micromets present at uh, um, the time of diagnosis even, and how many are getting a distant met after being diagnosed with a local failure. That could be the second wave. This is an observation. It's not a causative proof, okay? But what we see is that in patients with RT alone or RT plus short-term ADT, clearly the vast majority of mets in the beginning are coming from a relapse state, so they likely are occult. However, as you progress further, you see that many more uh, proportionately are coming from a, uh, a, a local failure state, which suggests that, that this pathway does exist. Gleason grade group high prostate cancer, high chance of occult, occult micromets in the pelvis or elsewhere. This is the dominant pathway, but this can occur, particularly if someone is surviving long enough for that to happen. So local control is indeed important in these patients. Something like lifelong ADT, um, and, and we'll talk about long-term ADT as a potentiator of radiation, could be improving local control, and that's part of the benefit that we see. So it's just a theory, but again, Gleason grade group five is inherently more aggressive locally and in terms of its propensity for occult micrometastases. So if ADT is a radio sensitizer, it's possible that Gleason grade group five is less sensitive to that aspect of radiation, uh, of, of that aspect of ADT. So short-term ADT and long-term ADT might not be sufficient to potentiate our RT. That, this would explain some of our observations, but lifelong ADT would because it would always suppress the cancer. So if this is the case, strategies to overcome this resistance would be beneficial. That could be physical dose escalation. So that's the brachy boost. So that would explain our uh, observations. That could be surgical removal, which was the German study. Now, because there are also occult macromets, you needed more than just surgery. So that also explained the other findings in the German study, as well as our findings, and then potentially systemic intensification, which I'll admit has not been studied, but that's a possibility as well, because we know, again, that ADT is a radio sensitizer, so maybe more powerful ADT agents could help the situation. So this could be something that explains many of our observations. And a hint of this comes from looking at um, who benefits from full pelvis radiation. Obviously, uh, Dr. Murthy is the uh, international expert here on this, having just uh, run uh, a very influential trial that I look forward to reading soon. But in our retrospective analysis, we looked at who benefits from whole pelvis radiation, and we saw a more robust benefit. It's not as clearly seen in this uh, unadjusted uh, survival curve, but we saw a more significant benefit um, if patients got EBRT plus brachy. And one potential explanation is those are the patients who have a controlled primary. If you can't control the primary, it's not going to matter if you're treating the pelvic lymph nodes because the, there's other problems that are going on. Similarly, you know, very, uh, people with very aggressive disease are also at risk for distant failure too, and they're also, it won't matter if you treat the uh, pelvic lymph nodes. So in overall theory, the high likelihood of a cold pelvic disease suggests that RT alone is insufficient. Follow-up RT with ADT may be sufficient. 
for res uh, eliminating residual microscopic disease. And that explains the German study and you know, suggests that RP plus RT plus ADT is going to be potentially as effective as EBRT plus BRT plus ADT. Modern high dose EBRT with sufficiently long duration ADT may also be highly effective, but a potential issue is those durations of ADT are not often used at large. Given the high chance of micromets, enhanced systemic therapy may also be critical. If I may just uh, for one minute, we, I think it's important to understand that this is not a monolithic disease. There's a lot of heterogeneity in Gleason grade group 5 prostate cancer. And we looked at this very recently in microRNA um, analysis of expression patterns in 2,138 patients with uh, biopsy proven or pathologically confirmed Gleason grade group 5 disease. Just cutting to the chase, we basically found that there are four different clusters. There are four different transcriptomic based clusters that have differences in DNA receptor, uh, DNA repair, androgen receptor signaling, and immune response. And these first two you can see are almost re reciprocal with each other, cluster one and cluster two. In, again, cluster one, more DNA repair, less inflammation response, more androgen receptor signaling. That turns out to be the cluster that has a higher genomic risk and a higher decipher score on average. It's about 15% of these Gleason grade group 5 patients. Okay, who cares? Does that matter? And it turns out uh, that it actually is validated when we look at outcomes. If you look at this high genomic risk cluster, the one that's characterized by the DNA repair, androgen receptor signaling proliferation, it has a much worse DMFS curve than the other types of um, of Gleason um, uh, grade group 5 disease. So this suggests that this is really the cohort that needs treatment intensification, and perhaps one day we can identify that and intensify treatments in these patients, and maybe even consider de-escalating patients in some uh, treatments in some of these patients. So overall, Gleason grade group 5 is a rare aggressive subtype of prostate cancer with limited prospective data to guide management. Retrospective data suggests the benefit to treatment intensification, which likely re relates to both maximal local and systemic control, but it is biologically heterogeneous, and we will get a greater appreciation of that in the coming years. Uh, a quick shout out, uh, Dr. Morthy is building a consortium of Gleason grade group five patients treated in India, and it'd be uh, important, I think, to contribute to that if you have patients. Thanks very much uh, for your attention and the invitation again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Kishan. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, Ganesh, uh, do you want to? Yeah, any questions on this, you can invite and take. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, maybe, uh, so we do not use brachytherapy for uh, various reasons in India uh, a lot. Uh, we do, uh, mostly we do high dose EBRT, IGRT kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. So in such a scenario, uh, when treating Gleason grade 5 with uh, radiotherapy, would you recommend uh, lifelong ADT based on what you have said? Yeah. Uh, and I, and I, uh, lifelong ADT is often used here, including orchidectomies. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that those data supporting the use of lifelong ADT were in patients getting low-dose radiation. So on those trials, you know, 66 to 70 gray. And I do think if we go to our um, retrospective study, if you look at the subgroup of patients that got 78 gray and then at least two years of ADT, including longer durations, they did have pretty good outcomes. So I don't think we need to necessarily do lifelong ADT. I think high dose radiation may also overcome some of the inherent difficulties with Gleason grade group 5 prostate cancer, but certainly I wouldn't ever do shorter durations of ADT. I don't think you need the brachytherapy uh, as long as you're doing something to intensify local treatment. You, you think SBRT would help, uh, Dr. Kishan? Uh, that's a, that's instead a good question. Of, yeah. Instead of brachytherapy. Instead um, of brachytherapy. Yeah, yeah, I think that it, I think it would, as long as we're retaining the appropriate dose of ADT. I think that's sometimes limitation, at least in the, in the U.S., uh, there's a big thought that you can kind of omit the ADT if you're giving a high enough dose, and I think that's not correct. But yes, personally, actually, and, and we're working on a, on a project with Dr. Murthy on this as well, where we're looking at outcomes in high-risk prostate cancer patients, including Gleason 9, where we're treating with SBRT. Uh, so that is a way of recapitulating a very high dose of radiation. might not be as high as a brachytherapy boost, but it's pretty high. It's a high equivalent dose. So I think it would be acceptable to do SBRT. So Dr. Kishan, I have two questions, uh, both are theoretical questions. So based on the, uh, your retrospective data, as well as others, uh, do you, are you convinced that for grade, grade group four and probably five would benefit with dose escalation? I think so. I think, you know, that's a, that's a very good question. I think it's difficult because they are at high risk of two things. They're at high risk of local failure 
but they're also at high risk of occult micromex. So we need to control the occult micromex first because that's still the predominant pathway of a developing dysentomex at 80% in the first five years. But provided that that's done with ADT, I think, yes, we should escalate the dose because we don't want to be in a situation where we've done a lower dose ADT, we've controlled them systemically, and then they have a local relapse. As we just heard earlier today, that can be difficult to manage. Which Although other, there are options. The other question is, since you mentioned about the heterogeneity, do you think the, uh, the alpha by beta would be different for these tumors? Uh, because yeah. of which probably the hypofraction would not be as effective as for, for uh, other groups of patients? So it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question, um, but I, I don't think so. I don't think the alpha beta would necessarily be different enough to change these results. Um, now, you're, you're right, there haven't been extensive studies of hypofractionation for many of the reasons that we've discussed that include patient grade group five, but you could argue that brachytherapy, even as a boost, is a form of hypofractionation, right? And there haven't been signals, at least in, at least in eight, when there have been more larger series looking at that, showing worse outcomes. So I think we should be okay from that regard. I think if these, pa if these are truly aggressive tumors, it's something that would not be captured by alpha beta. And, and if, you, if you happen to choose SBRD like our friend Dr. Vedang does in grade group four and five, uh, would, you, would, you, I mean, would you still give the 37 gray in five fractions or you would like to probably escalate the dose? Because uh, the, the, uh, Dr. Benzen's paper recently showed uh, that uh, as, you, as you reduce the dose per fraction, the alpha by beta also changes and it actually right. plat yeah, I mean, I think there is a benefit to going to a higher dose if you can do it safely. I think some of the times the limitation is, can we do it safely, right? But um, there are data uh, to suggest improved local control, even in lower risk, you know, inter low and intermediate risk prostate cancer for going to 40 gray in five fractions. So I think if we can safely do it, we should. Okay. Uh, well, I think it's time to uh, call it a night and call it a morning there. So, uh, Ganesh. Uh... Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amar Kishan and Vedang and Srinivas for that wonderful discussion. Uh, there are not uh, many uh, questions in the chat. Before giving it to Raghu to just answer some of them, uh, I would like to thank Fering, who was the educational sponsor here. Over to Raghu. Yeah, uh, Ganesh, uh, uh, most of the questions in the chat box were addressed by the speakers during their respective talks. So we will not take up uh, uh, any questions because of paucity of time. I, I'm sure this webinar has addressed all the aspects related to LAPC, uh, be it surgery or radiation, and uh, all aspects related to ADT uh, by Professor Klotz. And all the speakers did their job exceptionally well. I thank everyone. And uh, thank you, Ganesh, for conducting this program. And thanks, uh, Fering, for the support. And over to Ganesh for a vote of thanks. Thank you, Ganesh. So thanks to all the delegates who have been with us. There are numerous of them uh, since this has been a real sense multidisciplinary meet. And thanks to all the faculties who have been there and such wonderful talks and deliberations. Uh, international faculties, thank you so much. And I think then, uh, Fering, uh, thank you so much. Any, any other comment from... Uh, it is a long overdue program. It was superb. There are very contentious topics which were discussed. So all I could say is that it was fantastic. Thank you, Ganesh and Raghu, for you know pull, for pulling off such a you know a very contemporary topic. That's what I would say. It's very close to what we practice in in here. So very, it is at home for us. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, uh, close to 300 uh, delegates uh, have been participated in this, and uh, uh, around 65 delegates from uh, 10 uh, different countries out of India were part of this. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, okay. Thanks, all the speakers. And Ganesh. continue such good presentations to you. And I'll definitely will try to share the link with everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank good you all. Good night. Good night. Bye. Uh, we are off. Uh, we are off uh, live. Uh.